First 2023 afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good afternoon again. Please call the roll. Good afternoon. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Wheeler. Here. Colleagues, today marks a significant, oh, sorry, I guess I should let you do your job too. Uh, can you please read time certain item 926, please? Uh, that is a resolution. Uh, Mayor. Uh, may we have the council? Oh, I forgot rules of order and decorum. <laughs> I need to slow down. Good Thank afternoon. Could we Thank please hear the here. rules of order and decorum? Glad to. Thank you. Welcome to Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated as in this hearing, uh, the, the agenda said two minutes. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene, reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. And for testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. All right, thank you. Keelan, can you please read time certain item 926? It's a resolution. Ensure an effective, efficient transition to Portland's new form of government by establishing a coordinated, high level reporting structure for city bureaus, offices, and key functions. Good. And before we get into this, I just want to make sure I give a, a house cleaning heads up. Testimony today will be two minutes each. We have a lot of people signed up, we want to get through it all. Uh, so please uh, adjust your remarks accordingly, if necessary, so that you can get them in in two minutes. Thank you for that. Colleagues, today marks a significant milestone in the Charter Transition Project. It was nearly one year ago when Portlanders voted to fundamentally change their form of government and mandated us to restructure by January 1st, 2025. Today, the transition team will present their recommendation for a new city organization that reports up to a single city administrator and mayor. While this is not new information to us, it is our opportunity to hear from the transition team, take invited testimony, take public testimony, deliberate, and ultimately for us to vote on the resolution as well as any amendments that are put forward. This has been a long, thorough, and deliberative process that's engaged the public, city employees, bureau leadership, as well as council offices. Along the way, we've been fortunate to learn from the expertise of peer cities across the country and incorporate best practices shared by the International Cities Managers Association. We've seen multiple drafts of this organizational structure over the last several months, and we're considering final recommendations today. Ultimately, council must decide the final form that we approve for implementation. As we heard during yesterday's work session, in order to meet the technical requirements to be fully implemented by the January 1st, 2025 deadline, we need to adopt and begin implementing a new structure immediately. I highly encourage us to reach a decision point today. With that, I'd like to hand this over to our transition team. That's Michael Jordan, Shoshana Oppenheim, uh, Becky Tilson, and uh, I believe it's just the three of you starting us off today. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, commissioners, thanks for having us. I was going, <laughs> I was only going to introduce Shoshana. I didn't want to steal her thunder, but I just <laughs> wanted to say 
Go ahead, Shoshana. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> oh, we haven't coordinated this very well. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor, Council. I'm Shoshana Oppenheim. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the transition project manager managing the project to implement the 2022 amendments to the city charter. A quick roadmap of the staff presentation. I'll provide some context for where we are in the project and how our work fits together. Becky Tilson, the city organization project manager, will outline how the chief administrative officer developed the recommendation under consideration today. And then uh, CAO Michael Jordan will review the proposal and discuss the opportunities it provides for the city of Portland and the new city administrator. Tim Grew, the city budget officer, is here to answer any questions about the funding strategies we discussed yesterday. Almost a year ago, voters took the extraordinary action of changing our form of government. Directly after the results of the election were known, the city moved into act to action, mobilizing resources, engaging stakeholders, and delivering for Portlanders. I think we can all agree that the Charter Commission did not give us the luxury of time. The short runway to opening the new form of government on January 1st, 2025, requires us to prioritize the charter implementation along with the multiple challenges facing the city. We have shown Portlanders that we can do both. In fact, setting up our new form of government for success today positions the city of Portland to address the critical challenges facing our community for generations to come. What voters asked us to do is multifaceted, including cha changes to our elections methods, how we are governed, our internal reporting structures, the roles within the budgeting process, the charter amendments touch all aspects of city operations. A central element of the charter amendments is to transition city's leadership to a legislative council and executive mayor who manages the city with the help of the city administrator. Together over the last 11 months, we have been successful. This council adopted the code necessary to implement ranked choice voting, and the council appointed independent district commission established districts for city council elections. The city council appointed independent district, I'm sorry, salary commission, established salaries for the incoming elected officials. And this council adopted a framework for the operations for city council meetings. And now we are here together today to adopt a reporting structure for the city so that we can be ready for business on January 1st, 2025. The resolution before you today is foundational to the mayor council form of government where the future executive mayor runs the day-to-day -day operations with the assistance of a city administrator. And as the mayor mentioned earlier, the recommendation was formed by lessons learned from peer cities, our own independent research, professional organizations like the National League of Cities, the International Mayors, I'm sorry, City Managers Association, and most importantly, with the executive leadership made up of our city directors, deputy directors, and your offices. This resolution helps us prepare for the next fiscal year, which spans the current form of government and the future mayor council form of government and prepare for the council and mayor that join us in the middle of the budget development process. Among the first tasks for the future mayor will be to recruit and appoint a city administrator, subject to the council confirmation. The resolution that you're considering today will ensure that when that future mayor is elected in 2024 and launches the recruitment process, they can clearly articulate the organizational structure that the city administrator will lead. The reporting uh, structure that you are considering today is designed to create synergies, align programs, and improve service delivery. Adopting a reporting structure today allows us to pivot our attention to the city's most important resource, city staff, who are experiencing changes to their work groups, their reporting structure, and the focus of their programs. Adopting a structure today says that we can point to the destination and script the critical new, uh, moves to ensure our success and create an organization of change champions who are able to innovate and build Portland's future. Adopting the structure will also allow time for the critical 
technical alignments needed to make this structure a reality. The list of next steps is long. As you heard yesterday, the team shifts into high gear after you act to adopt Portland's future organizational structure. Thank you so much for your consideration. Congratulations to this council and the city leadership for your contributions to this impressive milestone to implement the charter amendments approved by voters. And with that, I'll pass it to Becky Tilson. Hi, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners and community members. Thank you for having us. I'm Becky Tilson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the project manager for the city organization project, working with the Office of Management and Finance. Thank you also to Shoshana for grounding us in the context and talking about why it's important that we accomplish this work now. I want to start by saying that the recommendation you'll see today, we aimed to set up the new city administrator for success by designing an organizational structure that reports to one administrator rather than five council offices as we have now. We set out to create something with reasonable spans of control, logical groupings of bureaus, and a leadership team with shared accountability for city goals and values. Operating as one unified city under a collective vision is an exciting opportunity for us to rethink and reshape how we work together as a whole city team. The process that got us to today's recommendation kicked off earlier this year. A February 2023 council resolution directed the city's chief administrative officer, Mike, right here, to work with bureau directors and council offices to recommend organizational structure changes to prepare for the new form of government ahead of the fiscal year 24-25 budget development process. Mm -hmm. To implement the project in the time allotted, we focused on changes at the program level and higher, not at the individual or team level. As a note, if you don't see a program called out specifically on the proposed organizational chart, that means that we're recommending that it remain in its current bureau configuration. As Shoshana outlined, this timeline means that we will have the time for budgeting in new service areas, implementing the technical changes, and supporting employees through the change. A lot of feedback, input, and research went into developing the recommendation. This spring, your council offices convened teams in the service areas established by Mayor Wheeler in January of this year to conduct a series of programmatic assessments, looking at what works and what can be improved in the service areas as well as across the city. Each team released two reports which were shared with employees and community. The executive leadership team, council offices, and subject matter experts met in service area groups and as a whole throughout the spring and summer, wrestling with philosophical and technical questions, debating different structures, and working to ensure that our core values are upheld. We conducted an employee survey and a manager survey designed specifically to inform the programmatic assessments. We did a review of community feedback from a variety of sources, including city audits of bureaus and programs, recommendations from the Ombudsman's Office, public comment received by the Portland Charter Commission, and the Portland Insight Survey and the Portland Engagement Project. And we compiled all of that into a community outcomes report. We conducted best practices research and hosted several panel discussions with experts from across the country on the role of the city administrator, the role of deputy city administrators, and on centering equity through organizational change. We utilized an equity tool to help make and explain decisions based on desired community outcomes and city core values. And we released a draft chart in September and collected a large number of community employee and council member comments and feedback. Collectively, all of this input and good thinking went into the recommendation that you see before you today. Next slide, please. I also want to take a minute to talk about why the how of how we got here matters. This project is about creating a new organizational structure, and it's also about further developing our organizational culture. When we consider the transition we're undergoing to the new form of government, it's important to consider the culture that we want to perpetuate and bring with us. So I want to talk for a second about the value of this exercise beyond the development of the organizational chart itself. Um, first, the executive leadership team, the team of bureau directors, is building a culture of collaboration and citywide perspective, and they work really well together. As we look to operate more as one city, and we'll be unified under the leadership of a city administrator and their deputies, this is a great benefit. <coughs> we have an organization made up of employees who will have a clear sense of where they will land. This will help the DCAs and the bureau directors as they're working within their service areas. We'll have transparency about our structure for community, and as we further build out teams, we'll have clarity around points of contact for community members looking to engage with their city government in its new form. We have centered our core values through the addition of equity, communications, and engagement officers, and a leadership team that's charged with upholding and advancing our commitments. 
We have employees who are familiar with the facts of the change and will be supported over the next year as we get ready to make the changes. We've heard from employees' leadership and community during this process and have received so many good ideas about additional ways that we can improve beyond these initial structural changes, which will help frame up the next phase of work. The change is right sized and implementable and sets up the new city administrator for success. And as my colleagues have heard me say a number of times, um, as I love to say, there are a lot of right ways to organize a city, and we're going to pick one of them. And the structure really can only take us so far. What we do with it, how we lead in it, how we continue to improve how we deliver services to Portlanders in the new form of government is what will make the biggest difference. So this is the starting point. I'm really grateful to everybody who took the time to engage with this work, um, and I really look forward to the hard and complex work of implementing um, our new structure and considering ways that we can continue to improve over time. Um, I'm going to pass it to CAO Mike Jordan to talk about the specifics of the proposal. Thanks, Becky. And uh, thank you to both of you for the part you've played in this last year, particularly. It's been a Herculean lift. And uh, I'll do a little thank yous at the end of my presentation. Uh, my role here today is to talk a little bit about the structure itself and what we're proposing, and uh, some of the changes that have been made since the first draft was let out for public comment on September the 12th. So what you see on this slide is the overarching framework. I'm going to concentrate on the right side of this. Our next slide will concentrate mostly on the executive office. So this slide shows that we have six service areas that we're calling them, uh, budget and finance, city operations, community and economic development, community safety, parks and recreation, and public works. The draft that went out on uh, September the 12th had five service areas, and uh, it included parks and recreation and the arts uh, in the public works service area. Uh, we got, as you can imagine, a fair amount of feedback uh, about that proposal. And um, listening to all of that feedback, uh, one of the major changes uh, between the first draft and this uh, draft that you're considering today is that there is an extra service area that has parks and recreation and the Portland Children's Levy in it. Um, I mentioned earlier that arts was also in the public works uh, service area. Uh, we, looking at the suite of services that are in community and economic development, uh, namely the uh, uh, film and events office that currently is in Prosper Portland, and the movement of the spectator venues from the CAO's office to the community and economic development group, uh, we believed that that suite of activities, that the arts fit well within that suite of activities. And so you'll see the arts in community and economic development. One of the other major changes from the first draft in September to this draft uh, is that uh, that draft had a natural resources uh, element within the public works uh, service area. We uh, put that in there because we were anticipating uh, a report from five of our bureaus that have been in a conversation now for all, nearly the entire calendar year. And conversations have been going on previous to that, particularly between Parks and Recreation and the Bureau of Environmental Services. Um, we were hoping to get a conclusion to that conversation. Um, I think we've received some preliminary indications of what the choices might be. Uh, but we haven't, uh, I would say we have not finished that conversation yet. And couple that with the creation of the sixth uh, service area for parks and recreation, it created for us at least a dilemma about where a natural resource department would be in the organization. Uh, and so what we did with this recommendation is we pulled the natural resources line from the org chart, but we kept language within Exhibit 2 that talks about this conversation that's been going on and our desire to continue that conversation and bring forward at a later date a recommendations on how a natural resources group could fit uh, within city government. And then lastly, for this sheet, I'd like to bring to your attention uh, and everyone's attention that uh, it's a little difficult to see, but on this chart near the top under the uh, icon for Portlanders uh, is a, a note for a leadership team. Uh, we really envision that the deputy city administrators that will head up these service areas, the city administrator, 
the assistant city administrator, who I'll talk a little bit more about uh, on our next slide, and the equity officer would make up an executive leadership team for the city. And I want to emphasize that I think we are all subject to thinking about organizational structure in a vertical way. Certain groups report to certain bureaus, which report, report to certain uh, executives who report to the mayor, ultimately. Um, and we think about the, the, the organization in a very vertical way. I think what this, this reconstruction of the way we uh, think about ourselves, what it offer, offers us, uh, particularly within this leadership team, is an opportunity to look horizontally across the organization and to think about the city as in a complete enterprise and how we allocate our human resource, how we think about the delivery of services, particularly within the city, to support the direct service delivery uh, of our bureaus. Um, it, it provides us that opportunity, which we quite frankly lack today. Uh, it is very challenging for us to think horizontally across the organization. And I think this new structure gives us an opportunity not only to think horizontally, but also to give clarity of accountability uh, and transparency about how we do business and what decisions get made and where they get made in the organization. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this slide concentrates on what we've been calling the executive office. Uh, under the new structure, uh, the mayor is the executive. Uh, in, in the new structure, and the mayor is required to hire a, a city administrator to assist that person uh, in the day-to-day -day management of the city. The charter also requires that at least all of the uh, uh, employees that are involved in the executive branch's business uh, need to report up through and to the city, be accountable to the city administrator. So we made a change in this office because of that, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, uh, I want to note before I talk about the city administrator that the mayor uh, on this chart not only appoints the city administrator, which the council must confirm, but also appoints directly the city attorney and the chief of police uh, also, and, and all, those are also confirmable appointments. Other than that, however, uh, all employees do report up to and through, uh, up through and to the city administrator. You can see on the chart that there is an assistant city administrator that uh, has five different sections, if you will, reporting to that person. Um, they are a communications group, um, a, uh, a community and civic life. That may sound familiar, uh, but the creation of a, a, an engagement officer to have that group report to them, but also to oversee engagement across the entire city. Um, the council operations group I'm going to come back to on the next slide and talk in a little more detail about that. Uh, the Office of Government Relations, which we have today. And then a new uh, office, which we are still, I would say, in the, in the mode of constructing, if you will, and that is a, a group called Portland Solutions. Um, you can see within that group that most of our houseless services and uh, many of our livability programs that have been developed over the last few years, uh, many of them under, uh, uh, under emergency order, uh, have been collected in this area. Um, I want to say something about changes. First of all, Portland Solutions in the September 12th draft reported directly to the mayor. Uh, we had uh, advice from the city attorney that it would be more appropriate for us to have that office report to the city administrator because of the issues I just mentioned about charter language and, and having uh, all of the uh, um, services that the city provides report up through to the city administrator. And secondly, um, that office used to have a, a line about uh, neighborhood associations and district offices. Uh, in it, we have moved those with a great amount of public input uh, over into the community and civic life group. So that group looks a lot more now uh, like the new manifestation of, of community and civic life that we have all become familiar with. The other change that I will mention before I move on is that um, the equity officer was a kind of a standalone office 
uh, in the previous draft. Uh, with advice from many, we moved uh, the Office of Equity and Human Rights out of the city operations uh, service area and up reporting directly to the equity officer. With that, I'll move on to the next slide, which is uh, a view of uh, a staffing uh, proposal for the city council and the mayor and also for a group of shared staff that would support uh, the city council in its operations. So the left side of the slide, the colored green colored boxes uh, represent the fact that we are proposing that two staff be assigned to each uh, councilor. We'll have 12 councilors, that means 24 staff uh, assigned to them so that they can uh, op do their uh, work uh, as legislators uh, at the city and also to be able to handle uh, constituent relations and any other services that they might need. Secondly, uh, the mayor has a staff of five, uh, including the chief of staff, uh, senior uh, senior aides and regular aides and then an administrative specialist. So five staff in the mayor's office. Also, which is a little difficult to see on the slide in the middle, there are some uh, uh, issues that we are also considering that the, there will need to be uh, business operations support. So think HR and think uh, uh, purchasing uh, those kinds of services that counselors will need from time to time. Uh, also uh, technology support uh, for uh, the offices, and then lastly, uh, security, which we obviously uh, provide also. Uh, it should, should be uh, noted that um, that set of blue boxes and green boxes, um, we have, uh, and the uh, supporting business operations technology and security support, we have geared this proposal to match the current uh, uh, expenditure level that we have in this year's budget to support the mayor and council. So that part of the slide, uh, it was really designed to match that level of expenditure. But we also know that the council will likely have to need support to do its legislative functions. They will likely, in our exploration of other communities that have larger councils like this, they all have committees of some kind. You passed some legislation earlier this year, 3.02, that envisioned the construction of committees. And so we really think there will need to be some support uh, for committees. And you see that in the shared council staff uh, model in the middle of the page, which involves uh, a manager, five employees to manage that part of, of the work, and also shared support staff in an administrative specialist, one uh, assigned to each of the districts to support the three counselors from each district. The shared council staff office also, I think, has a couple of other functions. Uh, besides supporting council and committees, um, really uh, being able to process legislation from the executive branch to the legislative branch and be kind of the traffic cop, if you will, to make sure that it gets processed appropriately with the auditor, uh, to make sure that the clerk gets what they need, to make sure the council runs appropriately. And then secondly, um, to be, if you will, the, the broker of communications and the need for information and, and uh, research that the council will need to have done by members of the executive branch uh, to be able to do their work. Um, we were originally thinking about the potential communications matrix between 12 councilors and 7,000 employees and became a bit concerned about how that might operate. And we certainly don't want to shut down communication in the organization, but we also think that that communication may need to be kind of managed, if you will, so that it can efficiently respond to council needs and make sure that the executive branch understands council's directions and, and requests for information. So uh, the last thing, or uh, not the last thing, but the last slide I wanted to talk about just very briefly is we also took a look at the current liaison assignments that uh, the commissioners and the mayor have uh, at the city. And as you can see, they are numerous. 
Um, and we took a shot at all of those numerous liaison responsibilities and what they entail and how they might be reassigned across uh, the new organizational structure uh, uh, so that uh, we can, uh, if you will, uh, manage the division of labor uh, in an appropriate way and also from a, 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 a subject matter content perspective uh, what might be most appropriate. Obviously, a new council and new mayor and new administrator may very well see it differently, uh, but this is our shot at uh, being able to look at how those liaison roles might get allocated. Um, next slide. Uh, this is my last slide. I want to be able to take just a moment. Um, I think both Shoshana and Becky have noted it uh, appropriately so. But as you can see on this slide, and it doesn't begin to cover all the people that have been involved in this in the last actually few years, because it really started with the Charter Commission's work uh, before the election. And I know that staff and the volunteers on the commission uh, touched literally thousands of Portlanders through that process. And as Becky noted, uh, we data mined a lot of that uh, intake that they did over two years to help us understand what Portlanders were expecting uh, of this change in government. And it was a, it was a very rich data source. Uh, so really for the last three years, uh, numerous, literally thousands of people have been involved at different levels. Um, but I want to particularly recognize the two people who are at the dais with me right now. Um, Shoshana, I think, had envisioned how we might go about project managing all these different component parts uh, well before the election even took place. Uh, and we certainly leaned on her good thinking uh, to get us going uh, at the very beginning. And of course, we, um, we uh, voluntold uh, Becky that uh, she was going to get the unique opportunity to try and figure out how this organizational structure could change. And, and literally invented the process uh, uh, to be able to uh, process all the questions that we had and go through and engage, as she noted, uh, engage with so many folks in the organization from the very top to the very bottom and everybody in between. And so, and as I'm fond of saying, uh, they did it all at a stupid fast pace. Um, and so I uh, want to appreciate their efforts. And with that, Mr. Mayor, happy to try and answer questions. All right, first of all, I, I just want to uh, take up where you left off. I want to thank you, Michael, and I want to thank Becky and Shoshana and your entire team. There were lots of people who have played a huge role in this up to this point. I want to acknowledge that transitioning an organization of this size and complexity in such a short time frame, a year, is, as you said, a nearly impossible task. We have a $7 billion budget, nearly 7,000 employees, dozens of bureaus, a city council, and what we don't have is a lot of time. And so I, I think you've done an outstanding job, particularly given how much outreach, how much input you've received, the work that you've put into this. I just want to acknowledge that, and I know I speak for the entirety of the council, that we truly appreciate your efforts. So thank you, thank you. so much for your leadership on that. So um, I also want to point out that the hard work is yet to be done. This is the broad brush work. Now we have to get into the specifics. And as we get into the specifics, um, that's where the challenges will lie. And um, I just want to start off by saying I really appreciate this council. I believe we have been communicative. We do not agree on the specifics, and that's okay. And so I just want to level set here today and acknowledge that. Um, but I, I really appreciate and respect the amount of work that my colleagues and their, their staffs have put into this effort as well. So uh, we will now move to the portion of the hearing where we entertain amendments to the resolution. The amendments proposed as of Tuesday afternoon, and, and I should step back, Michael, as I, I do at all of these and point out that, that what staff put forth was a supposal, if you will, a broad supposal that they believe encompasses the feedback that they've received from bureaus, from city council members, from staff, from the public at large, from interested groups. 
So they've done their level best to put forward a proposal, but it's ultimately up to this council to decide how to shape this. And so we have amendments that were proposed as of Tuesday afternoon, yesterday. Those are reflected in the Tuesday memo. You have that memo, and the public can also access that memo on the City Council website. There have been three changes to the amendments in the Tuesday memo. Uh, there was a change to Gonzales 3, a change to Ryan 4, and uh, if I understand correctly, Commissioner Ryan, there may be a new amendment, Ryan 5, put on the table this afternoon, yeah. potentially. To proceed efficiently today, we'll move and second the amendments as referenced in the Tuesday memo. That will put them on the table for further deliberation. <coughs> For the two amendments that have been changed, as well as the one that Commissioner Ryan would like to add, we'll ask the commissioners to read those in their entirety for the record, as they are not yet in the record in uh, their, their full capacity. If you're following along at home, please know that Rubio Amendment 1 and 2 will come up earlier in the process. Those have not changed. After all the amendments have been placed on the table for discussion, we'll ask the commissioners after that to go back and provide a more detailed summary uh, of each of those amendments so that those listening at home can better understand what we're voting on today. I feel that this is a necessary step given that the majority of amendments were included in the Tuesday memo and uh, will not be fully read. So if we've already got your amendments on the Tuesday memo, we don't have to hear the whole thing, chapter and verse, and, and uh, attachments. Then we'll hold public, uh, invited and public testimony before council discussion and ultimately a vote on the amendments. After we voted on the amendments, then we vote on the resolution as amended. Commissioners, uh, Please, uh, for the record, uh, read your name, the number of amendment, and brief reference to the topic, and then we'll seek a second for consideration. I will go ahead and model this for the group with my amendments. Mine are largely technical in nature. I'll kick this off uh, with Wheeler Amendment 1, which was reflected in the Tuesday memo regarding the impact reduction program. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Maps, second. So that is on the tape. On to Wheeler 2 is reflected in the Tuesday memo regarding the Community Board for Police Accountability and the Office of Community Based Police Accountability. Can I please get a second to move second. this amendment? Commissioner Gonzalez seconds this amendment, so it is also on the table for further input and deliberation. Commissioner Rubio, I understand you'd like to bring two amendments, Rubio 1 and Rubio 2. Yes, thank you. So um, I move that the first, I, I, start, I move that the first amendment is to move um, the chief sustainability officer uh, to report directly to um, <clears throat> the city administrator in the organizational chart, similar to the equity officer. Can I get a second? Yes. Second. second. Commissioner, uh, I think that was Gonzalez seconds. Permitting in, I'm oh, sorry, Rubio 2. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, second um, one is uh, regarding permitting and development. Um, and so I'm moving to, um, uh, on exhibit A, to combine, combine permitting and development services into one line that reads permitting and development services in the community and economic development service area section of the organizational chart to reflect council's intention to create one permitting entity per council resolution 37628. Second. So Commissioner uh, Rubio moves, Rubio two, Commissioner Ryan seconds, that's Rubio two. Commissioner Maps, I understand you have one amendment. Sure, uh, I just have one amendment. Uh, colleagues, uh, I move that we propose a change to the language of this resolution so that the direction <coughs> the city administrator or the um, chief administrative officer for the city to explore how the city can do a better job at managing Portland's natural resources. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds, uh, and that is maps number one. Uh, Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Gonzalez, as you know, your amendments are somewhat intertwined in order. I understand you both have five amendments to propose in addition to a shared amendment. Uh, 
Commissioner Ryan, do you want to go first with Ryan 1? Uh, sure. <clears throat> yes, I will. Ryan Amendment 1, Natural Resources. This amendment will result in a citywide operational natural area and tree management unit in the Parks and Recreation Service area, which would be responsible for the day-to-day, month-to-month management services for natural areas and the urban tree canopy. I'm reading this whole thing, right? Uh, it's in the memo, I think. For Ryan, one that was on the Tuesday memo, was it? Yeah, it was on the I don't Tuesday have to read memo, all that. so you don't have to. Thanks. Seconded. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez seconds, so that Color is Color coding was off here. Okay. Uh, and then Ryan Gonzalez, one, I don't know if either or both of you want to propose that. I'll propose it to be seconded. Okay. I so propose just to uh, update some of the branding associated with the parks and ch children's levy service areas, also to provide some continuity in the public safety space uh, and description of their work. Commissioner Gonzalez moves. Can I get a second? A second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. That will be Ryan slash Gonzalez number one. And Commissioner Ryan, Ryan two. Moving arts, uh, Ryan two, moving arts to the new service area. Second. So we have a motion from Commissioner Ryan, a second from Commissioner Gonzalez on Ryan two. That is now on the table. Uh, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, Gonzalez one. We call this service management. This is to start the early movement towards uh, flying and formation for the new service areas. It designates a commissioner in charge. Uh, also allows for the designation of a deputy for each commissioner. Instructs such deputies to cooperate with the CAO uh, and the city administrator, depending on how we define the role, in planning for the operations of the new form of government effective January 1, 2025. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Uh, Commissioner Maps seconds Gonzalez one. And we'll go back with more thorough discussions, and some of these we're going to need to read more into the record. Gonzalez two, reservation of authority. I'm sorry, Gonzalez two? Yeah. Uh, reservation of authority. Primarily purpose of this is to clarify what we don't intend to do with the very complex resolutions here, uh, is to assure that we're preserving authority granted under the city charter and budget authority in the current commission. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. That's Gonzalez two. Ryan three. This amendment ensures that council will approve the interim city administrator is hired before January 1st, 2025. Second. Is there a second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Ryan three. Gonzalez three. This uh, addresses some of the necessary coordination between commissioners uh, and the CAO uh, uh, in the final six months uh, of 2024 as we really prepare for the big handoff uh, January 1, 2025. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Ryan moves. Mayor, that one needs to be right Oh, yep, that's uh, new. Yep. Three. And which other ones, Haley, need to that's be That's the right only rightful? one. Ryan, and the new one, right? Only one so far, I meant. And Ryan, Ryan five? Ryan four and five. Ryan four and five. Okay, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, because this was not in the Tuesday memo, needs to read the entirety of the amendment. Go Just ahead. to be clear, there was some wordsmithing this was in the memo, but I'll read the, uh, okay. the, the it, it verbatim. Be it resolved, the city charter affirms the authority of commissioners in charge related to executive and legislative powers, including oversight assigned responsibilities until January 1, 2025. In addition, city council recognizes that a transition period relates to roles and responsibilities is needed. Before July 1, 2024, the mayor's office shall lead a discussion with commissioners in charge regarding roles and responsibilities, particularly related to budget and policy that will inform how the commissioners in charge and any interim city administrator or deputies work together for the final six months of 2024. Very good, and that was seconded. I'm Did I get a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Ryan. Gonzalez, four. Uh, I think that's me. Transition. No. That's, uh, this will, sorry, I'm getting caught up here. Uh, uh, it makes clear that the org chart will be effective uh, with the potential for deputy city administrators as of July 1, 2024. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, that's it. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Gonzalez five. This further clarifies the uh, authority of the interim CAO uh, throughout the transition period. Is there a second? 
Second. Brian seconds. Ryan four. Council Chambers and Workspace Construction. And Commissioner, I'll need you to read the uh, yeah. full text of this. This amendment memorializes the agreement on the construction of chambers and council offices. There has been some language changes after the publishing of the Tuesday memo yesterday, so I'll read the changes in the amendment and the amendment resolution to add and to be resolved statement and new exhibit C as follows, an amend resolution titled to and add and coordinate chamber and council workspace construction after the word functions. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds, that's Ryan four. And uh, last but not least, Ryan five, I understand you have a new amendment. Yeah, <clears throat> it's about authority to change amendment uh, five, Ryan amendment five. I do have serious concerns about the cost of this new form of government. The voters approved a ceiling of 8.7 million to implement this new form of government. Today's proposal moves that ceiling to 13 million result resulting in a total investment of 23.9 million. This amendment makes it clear that there is still work to be done as we enter the budgeting season and edits will need to be made. As this amendment was added today, I will read the amendment in its entirety. Whereas voters approved a cost estimate from 900,000 to 8.7 million in support of charter reform, whereas the current organizational proposed structure is estimated to cost 23.9 million in ongoing funds, whereas existing council and mayor's office budgets are 10.9 million, leaving a $13 million gap in funding the proposed organizational structure. Be it further resolved, council reserves the authority to make ongoing changes to exhibit A during the upcoming budget process. I'm going to second that. We, we had also communicated the potential of a friendly amendment, but upon reevaluation, I don't think the friendly amendment is necessary. So it's going to be an amendment to Ryan's amendment, no longer necessary. So okay, but you are seconding. I am wholeheartedly second. Okay, so Ryan five is now on the table as well. And uh, could, could I ask that I have a hard copy? Maybe Haley, I'm looking at you. I, I'd like to have a hard copy of Ryan five. In your oh, it is. This, yeah, oh, okay, thanks. Oh, in the back, thanks. All right, so now that all the amendments, are there any other amendments I should ask? I assume not. Now that all the amendments have been placed on the table for discussion, we'll go around and give. Lindley has something. Commissioner Ryan, I want to make sure we clarify for your amendment four, there was an, a bit of language that was already included in the Tuesday memo, and I just want to confirm that it was intended to include the language with there be it resolved and the exhibit C. So if you could just acknowledge that, that would be helpful. Yes, it was a wordsmithing moment. I should have just read that part. Okay, good. So now um, for those of you who are watching at home, you're probably thoroughly confused and that's okay. Uh, we were simply putting amendments on the table for further discussion. Now that the amendments have been placed on the table for discussion, we'll go around and give quick summaries for each of our amendments so that those here as well as at home can better understand what we're voting on today. That will also give you some idea potentially what you want to talk about in public testimony. We're not deliberating them yet. We're simply giving a little more uh, exposure to what the purpose of these amendments are. Uh, and I'll start. Wheeler 1 changes the reporting structure that clarifies that the impact reduction program does not report to the Street Services Coordination Center. That's what it does. It is effectively a technical amendment to make that clear. Wheeler 2 alters who the Community Board for Police Accountability and Office of Community based police accountability will report to. Because they are both uh, new bureaus and or offices, they're required to be independent. Therefore, they need to report directly in that chart to a deputy city administrator. Again, slightly technical, but that's what it does. Mr. Uh, Mayor? Yes, sir. Do you need us up here anymore? You don't like sitting here? Uh, I, I will stay here as long as you'd you like, on. but I thought I'd let, used to it after let others go. Uh, no, you don't need to be here, but undoubtedly you will be called we'll back at some here. point. So make yourselves more comfortable. Thank you, no, Michael. Uh, now I'm that all the amendments have uh, Thank you, okay. 
so I'll, I'll go back through the list again. Um, I put my two on the table. Uh, uh, Commissioner Ryan, uh, Natural Resources, Ryan one. Now we're going in different order. Yeah, just give a little little more detail so people who want to testify know sure. what, what the proposal is. I just thought you were going to go in the same order as the... Yeah, exactly, same order. Well, then when you do Rubio next. Uh, was Rubio yeah. before that? It went you, Rubio. You're right. Uh, yeah. Why don't we do Rubio 1 and Rubio 2? Thank okay. you. It's pretty simple, same as I explained before. Rubio 1 is moving, uh, it's amending uh, Exhibit A to add Chief Sustainability Officer um, in the City Administrator section of the organizational chart, similar to Equity Officer. And this is... Um, in response to uh, tremendous community input, not only into charter uh, change uh, commission work, but also um, in the development of this organizational uh, structure, um, both to council in our meetings and also in internal uh, <coughs> communication to, to uh, the staff. So that's Rubio 1. And then Rubio 2, Permitting and Development, this is a simple change. It amends Exhibit A. Uh, to Currently, uh, Permitting and Development Services are in two different lines in the organizational structure, which has led to a lot of concern and confusion among our external stakeholders. So this is simply moving it into the same line to uh, for streamlining and to uh, convey externally how this is um, in alignment with the intent of Council's uh, recent resolution. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan, uh, Ryan One Natural Resources. Just go in different order. I'm sorry, Maps One yeah. Natural Resources. Okay. Uh, the colleagues, thanks. Uh, my amendment basically proposes that we change the language in this resolution so that it directs the city's chief administrative officer to explore how the city can do better at managing our city's natural resources. Uh, some quick background for folks who are just catching up to this conversation. In February of this year, this council passed resolution 37609, which directed uh, planning and sustainability parks, BES, water, and PBOT to establish a process that results in a work plan for coordinating and integrating services related to our natural areas. In response to that directive, uh, the directors of those bureaus and staff uh, participated in three workshops on natural resources management. This group also contracted with Eco Northwest to analyze more than 140 documents, which describes the various ways our city bureaus work together to manage our natural spaces. On top of that, uh, this work group contracted with Catalyst LLC to conduct employee and advisory committee surveys. Uh, which yielded over 80 pages of comments from more than 152 respondents. In turn, those analyses were presented to almost 100 staff, managers, and leaders from stakeholder bureaus. Uh, they also presented these results to the Public uh, Portland Utility Board and to a joint session of the Portland Parks and Recreation Board and the Urban Forestry Commission. Now, the results of those uh, analyses basically uh, found and highlighted five areas in the natural resources space where the city should strive to do better. Those areas included stormwater management, land conservation, watershed conservation, carbon reduction, and growing our tree canopy. Colleagues, uh, the amendment that I bring forward today is straightforward. It just directs the city to continue to support these efforts to improve the way we manage our natural areas. Um, I want to be clear on what this amendment does not do. This amendment does not call for the creation of a new bureau, nor does this bureau strip um, any other, or nor does this amendment strip any bureaus of authority staff or uh, funding. Instead, the amendments I bring forward today, and I'll just read it real quickly, or at least a portion of it real quickly, it says, quote, now therefore be it resolved that city council directs the chief administrative officer with the cooperation of city bureaus to hire an external facilitator to continue to their work started in March of 2023 to evaluate potential coordination, consolidation, or matrixing of natural resources, green infrastructure, urban watershed management, natural areas, urban tree canopy, uh, environmental remediation, climate resilience, and other aligned services. That work plan shall be brought to the chief administrative officer and shared with council no later than December 20th of 2023. 
Once that work plan is submitted, the bureaus will work together to begin a thoughtful, structured public process to determine how these services can be aligned. Um, and I'll skip a little bit of language here. Um, that Basically, that uh, plan on how these services should be realigned will come back to this council on September uh, 30th of 2024. Thank you. Ryan One Natural Resources. Yes. <clears throat> this amendment will result in a citywide operational natural area and tree management unit in Parks and Recreation Service Area, which would be responsible for the day-to-day, -day, month to month management services for natural areas and the urban tree canopy. This new organizational unit will build upon existing operational management structure to be more accountable, efficient, and effective meet regulatory and financial requirements and best practices, and will include community engagement and community stewardship related to this work to the city's natural areas and trees. Portland Parks and Recreation is the largest operational natural area and tree service provider for the city of Portland with almost 8,000 acres of natural areas and 1.2 million park trees under its management. Portland Parks and Recreation has successfully found a balance of protecting the environment and urban forest and connecting Portlanders to nature. Public safety in natural areas is primarily responsibility of park rangers. As one of our greatest threats to an urban wildfire, Portland Parks Rangers, Portland Fire and Rescue, and PPNR Land Stewardship work together to mitigate urban wildfire threats. Portlanders and environmental advocacy stakeholders have repeatedly demanded that the city of Portland prioritize nature in our city clean rivers and streams, a healthy urban forest, and connecting Portlanders to nature. This is not an effort to let certain bureaus invest less in natural resources, but to the contrary. The proposal will ensure the city of Portland is more effective, more efficient, and more coordinated with investments, and all resources will be managed for accountability to the community and city council. I'd like to highlight briefly what this amendment does not change. Due to environmental services expertise and regulatory role as a city's sewer and stormwater utility, BES will continue to have strategic thought, leadership, policymaking, and funding responsibilities for protecting public health and the environment. By collecting and recovering resources from the city's wastewater, managing stormwater, and restoring and protecting Portland's rivers, streams, and watershed. Transportation will continue to manage public right-of-way and transportation services, except for how they will relate to natural areas and trees. Water should not transfer Bull Run watershed management responsibilities due to its unique qualities and the use for the city's drinking water. I'd like to thank Director Long and her team for bringing a common sense proposal for Council's consideration to, to make sure we have a vibrant communities in Portland by supporting nature. We need to become more efficient and effective together. I want our new form of government to align city bureaus to support nature and make Portland a place where families and all Portlanders want to live, work, and play. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Gonzalez, one. Uh, I think we described. Oh, go ahead. Do you want to introduce? Oh, sure. The renaming of this service area speaks to a more aspirational aspect of this body of work within our city. We must confront an undeniable truth. We're losing families. We're losing enrollment in our schools. We're also losing elders who I wish would stay in Portland and age in place. Quite frankly, they're leaving our city in grim numbers. For the first time since the 80s, our population growth and school enrollment are waning. There needs to be more focus on creating a thriving, more livable city for all Portlanders. And so I just think it's important that we really focus on families at this time and have a, a work area that's really uh, looking out for our families and our elders aging in place. That's what we need for a vibrant city, for a vibrant economy in a city that we all love. I'll pass it on to you for public safety. Uh, I think I've alluded to it's a continuation of the description of the space uh, and I uh, was just assuring some continuity. Leave it at that. Great. Uh, Ryan, two moving arts. Colleagues, in the spirit of Portland's long-standing commitment to arts, culture, and innovation, I'm here today championing a future that interwines our city's values and our actions. Portland, as we know, is ever-evolving, ever-growing, weaving the arts into the fabric of our city's beloved institutions, Portland Parks and Recreation, the Children and Youth Levy, natural areas under the banner of vibrant communities isn't just about reshuffling. It's about reimagining and deepening our commitment to every community member. Why this move, why now? 
because in Portland, arts and culture aren't just add-ons. They are the lifeblood of our neighborhoods, the stories we tell, the history we honor, and the future that we envision. The service areas where we play, sport, and convene in community and showcase our diverse talents and cultures that define us as Portlanders. Our parks are a testament to our love for nature and gathering, have long celebrated the beauty of diverse expressions. It's not just about efficient management, it's about holistic vision where every tree, every trail, and every piece of art tells a tale of our shared journey. Pairing this with the children's levy, we can open doors for our youth, sparking creativity and ensuring that our next generation remains deeply connected to the cultural threads that make our city unique. It's a vision where art and education walk hand in hand, inspiring and uplifting. In essence, we're not just reorganizing, we're revisioning. We're crafting a space where arts don't just exist, but they flourish, where they become the rhythm and rhyme of our daily lives. I wholeheartedly support these amendments by seeking a vibrant future where arts and culture are not just on the sidelines, but at the heart of our collective identity. Thank you. Uh, Gonzalez one service management. Uh, I, in the intro, I described in reasonable detail. Uh, this, as well as the rest of my amendments, are on the one hand uh, largely legal oriented in clarifying authority through the transition, uh, but secondarily to um, facilitate prompt support uh, from commissioners uh, to the CAO and uh, to the charter reform implementation process. So we're trying to do two things simultaneously, clarify legal responsibilities and uh, authority uh, during this transition period, uh, but also how we best facilitate cooperation among the moving parts during that period. Thank you, and Gonzalez, two, reservation of authority. Uh, I think I described two, three, and four, and five uh, reasonably well in the intro. So Got it. Good. Uh, then we'll move to Ryan three, approval of interim CAO. Yeah, just uh, a practice that I know is part of the new form of government, just to be actively engaged in working with the mayor to approve the interim. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan four. Council chambers and workplace, workplace construction. Well, Gonzalez three is. No, uh, he's he's already described three. He did four three and five. four. He's different. And five. Yeah. So okay. we're back to Ryan four. I'm digging. No worries. You did all three. You did all four years. Did I? For once, I was brief. <laughs> this amendment is about the council chambers and construction place. We had three work sessions. Felt like more on this topic. Um, this amendment memorializes the agreement on the construction of the chambers and council offices. There have been some language changes after the publishing of the Tuesday memo, so that's why we read that earlier. Great. But and basically, we're all on board. We got there. Great. Bravo. Uh, last okay. but not least, Ryan Five. The authority to change. Yeah, I, I read that a little bit more about that earlier. I just think it's important that as elected officials and that we're transparent with what the voters, the will of the voters, um, and that that was obviously in all of the materials. And so we have to make certain that we, um, even though we're right now aspirationally working on the org chart, we have to do a lot of work that um, where we're decoupling the budget. When the budget sessions come up, we need to get back on uh, track in terms of honoring the ceiling that the voters approved. Perfect. Okay, so now that all the amendments have been motioned and seconded and briefly described, it's my understanding that some of my colleagues have invited testimony. Uh, I would ask that invited testimony, please keep your remarks to no more than three minutes so that we can get through all of the people here who are here for public testimony. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, would you like to kick off invited testimony? I believe you have four folks joining us today. Yeah, um, Willie Levinson, there you are. If you could come up with Ilana Perligini, where she's been here all day. Thanks for being back. Morning and afternoon session. One of your children. And J.R. Lilly, are they here? They're, they're um, doing it remotely, but we do have um, Jason Margolis here, so you can come up any time when they're, when they're finished or you can come up now. I realize you have two kids, it looks like, next to you, yeah. No, they're not mine. Oh, I just, uh, <laughs> I just assumed you should never do that, yeah. Uh, Willie Levinson uh, with Human Access Project. Just wanted to uh, speak in favor of Ryan's amendment to keep uh, operation of the uh, trees within the Parks Department. 
parks does a great job of maintaining the trees um, and having the connection between property ownership and a significant part of um, uh, the parks being the trees, it, uh, it, it makes sense to keep it where it is. Good afternoon. Good to see you all again. Ilana Pertelgini with the Portland Parks and Rec Advisory Board. I'll wholly admit that I've not been here all day. I went home and <laughs> grabbed my kid who is not in school and is having a great civics lesson behind us. Um, I am here speaking on behalf of the Portland Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. When I say I'm here on behalf of the board, I want to clarify that we are a board of members who live from the west side of the river to Rockwood and the farthest stretches of northeast Portland down to Selwood. We have members who are disability rights activists, retirees, runners, parents, policy consultants, recreation consultants, environmental and nature advocates. Um, we bring all of these perspectives and many more when we think about the future of parks. And we are thinking a lot right now about the future of parks, both parks with a small p. What do our parks in our neighborhoods in a growing city with a growing population, um, we hope to see it growing again. We believe it will be and we need to plan for that. Um, what does that look like? And also parks with a big p. How do the services overseen by the Bureau of Parks and Recreation look as you all realign our city? And does that strengthen our park system or does that detract from our park system? The Parks Board wrote you all a letter previously when you came out with your initial proposal with some values about what we hope you kept in mind. I'm here today to reiterate just one piece of that given the um, amendments that you have before you. It is really critical to members of the Parks Board that you align parks with a new natural resources group and that they be located within the same service area. There are three reasons that we believe that's so important. The first is it allows for holistic planning. Earlier this morning, I sat before your commission and um, Commissioner Rubio, you actually uh, used the words I was planning on saying today when you said that it was important for us as a community to think about, think holistically about parks. And as a parent of two young children, often when I think about parks, I think about playgrounds and sports fields, but our parks are also the centers of our local ecosystems. They keep us healthy and they keep our watersheds healthy. They are sources of shade and clean air um, and a part of the solution to our climate crisis. And if we are not approaching our natural resources and tree canopy holistically, uh, we are not able to do the full work of our parks. You have also, as Commissioner Maps noted, already started this work. Um, your bureaus have been working together to figure out how to better align services for a number of years. And one of our board's recommendations when we heard the presentation recently about that work was that centralizing the work around our tree canopy specifically and around natural resources more broadly could create significant efficiencies within city government creating a place for this work to occur within the new city structure, that location where those efficiencies can be achieved, and placing parks and recreation and the operation of those natural resources together builds on the work you've already become, begun. It's the next logical step. And finally, I promise I'm wrapping up, Mayor. Um, it allows for the best operationalization of the work. At the end of the day, your bureaus are here to implement the work. And we can go round and round about values and how things best align from a values perspective. But based on what we see as the advisory body for your Bureau of Parks and Recreation, we believe that given Parks and Recreation's um, work already overseeing the vast majority of land management and tree management in our city, that it can anchor the work. Uh, we believe that Parks and Recreation aligns well with much of the other programming you're looking at, like the Children's Levy and our city's arts programming. We also believe, though, that that service area can be the place where we address our natural areas, and that if we create, as Ryan One does, a city operational natural area and tree management unit and place it within the same service area as Portland Parks and Recreation, we can best implement the programs that you all are working to have more efficiency within. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, JR, can you unmute? The floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. 
Tachini Nishle, Sanjikana Bashishin, Tachini Tashedo Taban Tashnala. For those who don't speak Navajo, my name is J.R. Lilly, he, him, his. I am um, the Navajo Nation, part of the Red Runs Water people, and born for the Clintwell people. I am um, coming today. I wear a number of hats in the community, serving on the Native American Community Advisory Committee with PPNR, as well as the incoming board chair for the Portland Parks Foundation. I also serve as the an urban forestry commissioner and with the East Portland Parks Coalition, uh, former PPNR budget advisory committee member and several other capacities that help advocate and speak for our trees. Uh, testifying today in support of Ryan, one, the amendment to add a citywide operational natural area and tree management with parks and rec, mainly be because I believe it will better support our goals of including community voices in the process to grow, to grow our tree canopy, especially in places like East Portland where we need more trees, uh, not just for shade equity, but also for our critters and our birds and just the overall health of the community. Places where there's trees that are planted uh, have a better outcome for all communities on various levels. Um, when Portland Parks and Rec does some really good engagement with the neighborhoods around a park site like Mill Park or Park Lane, um, other areas, other departments in the city could really benefit from that engagement already and that existing relationship that's happening. Uh, like Peabot could, um, that, that's planting street trees nearby could benefit from that engagement and community voice. Because I know when community, we just see trees. We see trees, um, but us bureaucrats, when we look at the situation, we see park trees, we see street trees, we see trees on private property and trees on business property. And those are all managed by different people. And so who we have to give, you know, feedback to and thought process is like four different people. If we can just consolidate some of those processes together and share the engagement would be, a, the community would really appreciate that. Uh, the hope of this process would be to support um, staff members just working closer together in these area the idea of like a one-stop shop for community to really engage and let our voice be heard and help um, just practices of trees and making sure that they're taken care of properly. Uh, trees provide so much benefit for our community, uh, including reducing stress. So they say, if you're making a intense phone call, do it underneath a tree, it definitely will help with the outcome. Um, and so I just want to, as many ways that we can advocate because look, the health of our trees is connected to the health of our community. The better we can steward them and make the process better. Um, my community refers to them as the one, our one legged relatives. So thank you for your support and um, any questions I'll be available. Thank okay. you. Uh, Jason Margolis, if you could come up. Jason's the arts laureate for our city and also the leader of the band program at Roosevelt High School. Thanks for being here, Jason. Yeah. Sorry I assumed every child near you was yours. No, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I do have children at home, so. I know, okay. Um, yeah, I wear blue today to show my solidarity for my fellow teachers who are on their first day of strike. And I just got back from Roosevelt where all the teachers were convening. And I believe I'm here today to talk about just how this affects art programs in general. Um, from a performing arts perspective, um, I was speaking with our choir teacher today and they were on track to do their final tech production today for their play that starts tomorrow. And depending on how long the strike goes on, um, everything's getting pushed back and in terms of even ticket sales and auditions for the musical, which are supposed to take place later in the month. Um, for music teachers, it's, it's just, you know, coming off of the pandemic, I feel like we are just starting to get traction. And um, it's so devastating for kids not to be together because all these art forms are contingent on students being together. And of course, I realize we're all fighting for rights for teachers, which is rightfully so. Um, but in the end, we're, we're really hurting students who desperately need arts right now of all forms, whether it's performing, visual,
dance, whatever it is. And uh, we hope that this ends quickly. We would have all thought, I would have thought that this would have been resolved by now, but it's not. So yeah, um, really hoping this doesn't go into December and longer than that because you know, we have a district jazz festival in December and you know, every day counts. So yeah, do you have any questions for me? Uh, well, thank you, Jason. I, I mean, I think you're in the moment and, yeah. I, and I think a lot of people know that. And yeah. we, I know earlier, I think Darian Jones reached out to you and we're, you know, we're, all, we're talking about elevating the arts portfolio and including it with children and youth. And so thank you for being a teacher a yes. music teacher and for building a robust program. Yeah. And um, I look forward to us continuing to build together. So thank you for being here. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan, does that conclude your invited yes, testimony? It is. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you to the invited speakers. Uh, does anybody else have invited testimony? Very good. We have, I believe, a couple of dozen people signed up today for public testimony. We want to make sure we hear from everyone. So we will ask you, please, please, please. Do your best to limit your talking points to two minutes so that everybody has a chance to be heard. Uh, there will be a clock available that you'll be able to see. If you're testifying virtually and haven't already, please take a moment to switch to gallery view on your settings. That'll make it a little easier for you to see what's going on and to see the time clock. Uh, when you have 30 seconds remaining, you'll see the timer begin to flash and then it'll turn red when your time is up. At the end of those two minutes, the council clerk will uh, meet you, mute you if you're not wrapping up. We'll let, give people the opportunity to wrap up, um, but we really ask people to stick to two minutes. Keelan, it's up to you from here on out. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. First up, we have Bob Salinger. Hey, Bob. Good afternoon. afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Willer, members of City Council. For the record, my name is Bob Salinger, and I'm representing Willamette Riverkeeper and our thousands of members in the Portland metro area. Uh, we have a long history of working on watershed issues in Portland, and I personally have served a couple of terms on the Parks Board, uh, the Pub, uh, Watershed Advisory Council, uh, and about a dozen uh, budget committees for BES and parks. We are here today to strongly endorse MAPS Amendment Number 1 uh, and to strongly oppose Ryan Amendment Number 1. Uh, MAPS Amendment Number 1 uh, allows us to move into a new era of natural resource management. We've long been a leader in these issues, but the fact is, is that we have slowed down and we started to go backwards. Uh, it's important to understand what MAPS Amendment Number 1 does. It creates a Natural Resource Bureau, adds it back into the org chart. It does not specify what that bureau will do. That's a process to come, but it gives us a chance to think about all the different elements of natural resources, uh, trees, natural areas, but also super fund. Uh, science, fish, and wildlife, regulatory compliance, uh, uh, stormwater strategies, and so on. We have multiple elements. We need to rethink how they come together, how they're matrixed. This gives us that opportunity to do that. It, it's a visionary approach. Uh, it's important as we do that that we think about how it is funded, uh, how, these, how this new bureau relates back to other infrastructure bureaus, uh, and to make sure that we do it in an intentional way. That being said, we think it is the path forward. We do oppose Ryan Amendment number one. Uh, we think this is a last minute, poorly thought out uh, proposal. Uh, it pulls trees and natural areas out of, out of BES, but doesn't address any of the other issues that are so important. It doesn't address potential legal issues such as the Anderson lawsuit. Uh, and it basically we just modifies an inadequate status quo. We can do better. We urge you to go with the MAPS Amendment number one. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Walter Weiler online. Welcome, Walter. Hello. I'm Walter Weiler, uh, downtown city resident and voter. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, while I respect the dedication, the work, and the process of the proposal you're discussing today, my thoughts reflect the impression of me just as a single voter. 
I urge you to reject this proposal as too complicated, too expensive, and lacking adequate community input. The plan should be sent back for work regarding achievement structure, cost, and community input goals that would be set by the council. Too complicated. Many new positions populating at least two additional management levels is an unnecessary first step of implementation. Recruiting, training, and organizing work will take months before operations smooth. Too expensive. An additional $13 million plus renovation of City Hall plus voting system implementation will be a complete surprise to voters who approve the ballot measure. I liked Commissioner Ryan's amendment. Finally, lacking community input, the charter advisory team, I understand, was not seriously engaged in the development of this plan, and there was virtually little other community input. My time's not up, but I'm finished. Ladies and gentlemen, have a good day. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. It's always good to see you. Brevity, brevity. Uh, we have the next three people may come up together. Marianne Fitzgerald, David Chen, and Zary Santner. Welcome. Should I begin? Why don't you go ahead and start? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marianne Fitzgerald, and although I'm the president of my neighborhood association, I'm here on behalf of myself only. Um, neighborhoods have always taken a horizontal view of the delivery of services throughout the city. And when I saw the organization chart that came out last week, particularly the big exhibit with the electeds and mayors, it's top heavy. It's got unclear authority and accountability to the people of Portland, and it's crazy expensive. Um, I urge you to start lean and build later, rather than build this big bureaucracy and have to make cuts that we can't afford these positions. Um, I want to just say that I didn't know until this week about the uh, maps and Ryan proposals for natural resources. My neighborhood has two parks and three natural areas and no stormwater system. And nobody has come to either my neighborhood in Southwest Portland nor the Sweeney Parks Committee to discuss this. And you know, we need more discussions, so I support Mr. Maps's proposal to study it further and come into the community, because we live here. We want to use these resources, and nobody's checked in with us. So I, I do want to thank Commissioner Ryan for moving the neighborhoods and district offices a little further up in the civic engagement, but I still don't understand why there's eight city administrators and why civic engagement is with the junior administrator the assistant administrator rather than the deputy administrator, when everybody needs to be at the table um, as peers, not as um, unequal um, people. So I just want to um, conclude agreeing wholeheartedly with the last two speakers that there has not been enough meaningful civic engagement on this proposal for the last you know, year. And it's very expensive, and I'm really concerned about the trade-offs and services that the people will experience in order to pay for a very top-heavy administration. Thank you. Thank you. David Chen. Hi, David. Uh, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, thank you for the chance to talk to you today. Uh, last I saw you, other than Commissioner Gonzalez, was about 20 months ago when you appointed me to the Charter Commission, um, and I, I was not in the supermajority. I'm here to mention two things. Uh, first, in the proposed org chart, it looks like the city administrator is overseeing the council staff. And this is kind of like having the police chief supervise the staff of the community police oversight board, or in our federal structure, having the president supervise congressional staff. Probably council staff uh, should be included in the city's HR system, IT infrastructure, and other on basic admin functions, but it might be worth looking at how legislative staffs in other cities are managed or, to my point, not managed uh, by the executive function. Uh, second, uh, I think a little more attention needs to be paid to the charter section that empowers the mayor to appoint the city administrator. Uh, this is section 2401F, if you're taking notes. Uh, on January 1, 2025, the mayor elected in November 2024 uh, 
takes office and they're empowered to appoint the city administrator. And as you know, that appointment needs to be confirmed by the city council, the new city council. Section 202401F also says that the mayor acts as the city administrator if the office of the city administrator is vacant. So we could end up indefinitely with a mayor acting as a city administrator because they have either not appointed a city administrator or because council won't, won't confirm the mayor's appointee. Uh, this could make the mayor's office more attractive than some critics have been saying. Uh, but if you don't think that's the right result, uh, I encourage you to fix it. Um, and thank you for all you do for the city. Thank you. And, and David, if I could just quickly, you know, we, we did think about that. And the expectation is the interim city administrator will actually overlap from when I leave office on December 31st for six months in the new mayor's term. So there, the, the expectation is there will not be a vacancy and that that city administrator would leave once the process has been completed and new city administrator has been appointed. Although the mayor lo longer term, that could happen. The mayor can unilaterally remove the city administrator. Though. Correct. Yeah. yeah, the mayor, it actually brings up a, or Henry, it, it brings up a change in what our amendment proposed. We had originally proposed that the council approve the interim CAO, which might align with the new charter structure. We actually softened the language in the amendment to merely be consulted on it, it does, the testimony actually raises a question if in softening it, we inadvertently took away essentially ratification of that CAO for the new form of government, right? If council had approved that CAO, is there an argument that that's somehow more effective going into the new form of government? I, I don't know. I'm just posing an open legal question. Your, your exchange actually creates an interesting, an interesting question that I don't think we're going to resolve today. But Thank, thanks, and and we can raise it later with legal. You have a city attorney. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, David. Hi, sorry. Good afternoon, Mayor. Members of the council, my name is Zary Santner. Some of you know that I worked for Portland Parks and Recreation for over 30 years. The last eight years as its director. I was prepared to um, offer three points in my testimony. I'm afraid the time is not going to allow me to cover all of them, but I'm going to give it a shot. The first point that I wanted to make uh, was that parks, recreation facilities, natural areas, urban forests, they are not luxury. They're not amenities. They're part of cities' infrastructure, and they should be treated as such. In that light, I firmly believe that they should be located with other city infra infrastructure. And I want to uh, stay away from the word public works. Everything that the city does is public works. We need to call those bureaus infrastructure bureaus, and parks and recreation is one of those. So they should be aligned with other infrastructure bureaus and report to the same deputy city as administrator. The second thing that I want to mention is that when I was with Parks, I, I worked uh, very closely with, I and my staff worked very closely with a lot of other infrastructure bureaus because uh, our work, every, every work that we did, it touched upon that. And um, we found that working, um, well, <laughs> I'm not even going to make my second point. Um, I realized that uh, whenever we, Commissioner of Parks, had another infrastructure uh, under its portfolio, the two bureaus work most effectively and productively. And that's another reason that I think the infra uh, Parks Bureau should be under the infrastructure. The second point is that I believe that all the natural resources, urban forests, I'm afraid. Why don't you make your point? Should I make my point? Yeah. Um, I want to give you a little bit of context, Mayor, if, if I may. When I, was a bureau, if, if, when I was a bureau director, I formed a, natural, a, a, a specific unit in the bureau called City Nature. 
I brought the urban forest and natural resources together. And the intent was collaborations, transparency, and efficiencies. But one thing that it did, it signified two elements. One was the in inadequacy of funding for those. And the, th third, the second one was that that fund was fungible. It was used at the end of the year to fill the gap, the shortfall in other divisions. And I wanted to stop that. So I think although parks, we all loved our natural areas, our urban forests, but when push came to shove, the asset, expenditure on assets would be minimized. Thank you. And, okay. Appreciate it. Next up, we have Terry Harris online, followed by Sarah Silkey and Jenny O'Connor. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Terry Harris. I'm an alternate member of GTAC, testifying in my personal capacity. Um, I've provided detailed written comments. With three minutes, I'd um, also explain why you should adopt only a budget framework today and remand the org chart for future refinements. But with these two minuscule minutes, I will simply urge the council to reject outright the mayor and council scheme you've been presented here. The structure and staffing for the mayor and council made only public a week ago is ill-conceived, massively under-resourced, and misaligned with the charter and charter amendments. First of all, the chart's incomplete. Uh, the mandatory roles of the auditor and city attorney are not accounted for here. Second, the lines of reporting and accountability to the extent that they exist at all on this chart violate the separation of powers called for by the charter amendments. Legislative staff need to be hired, fired, and supervised within the legislative branch. And shared staff, by definition, reporting to multiple bosses is doomed to failure. Finally, the entire exercise, both in the council and the mayor's office, is wildly under-resourced. You were told yesterday that the council could expect probably a minimum of five council committees. Here, cities average seven or eight. But where are the committee clerks, the records clerks, the researchers, the bill drafters, a legislative director, a committee council, a parliamentarian? There's no provision here for the much larger responsibilities of a council president. All we see here are two analysts and two coordinators floating in space. Meanwhile, it's the elected mayor at the very top of the executive branch who supervises the city administrator. It will be important that that mayor has the tools to do that supervision in a substantive way. This chart does not come close to providing those tools. The bottom line and last year's budget note notwithstanding, the mayor and council chart won't cut it, send it back. Thank you. Sarah Silkey. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Silkey. I use she, they pronouns. I am a city employee, but I am here on leave in my personal capacity as a Portlander who grew up here. I am concerned about the financial impact of the proposed transition plan on our ability to provide basic city services to residents. It is too top heavy. Please excuse me if I'm a little distracted. My three kids are here in the chambers due to the schools being closed. We support Portland area teachers on strike. First, I totally agree with the testimony of Bob Salinger and Marianne Fitzgerald about the importance of the environment to Portlanders and the importance of the horizontal uh, city services. I am really excited about a lot of aspects of the proposed new organization, especially the focused natural resources unit. And I understand that the time and budget constraints everyone is under to get this ready by January 2025 is tight. However, there are worrisome parallels between PPS and the City of Portland's proposed org chart here. This proposal adds six very high level positions in addition to the voter mandated city administrator at the same time that Willamette Week and the Portland Business Journal are reporting on layoffs in development services and soon to come in transportation. We could use that same money instead of for six high level positions, you could hire over a dozen maintenance techs to actually do the work of filling potholes or building more ADA curb ramps every year or a dozen Portland street response staff to support getting people off the streets. 
The analogy to Portland Public Schools is that teachers want basic things like functioning and safe classrooms, just like Portlanders want basic services, not additional layers of administration. I ask you to consider a commitment to no net addition of high-level management positions in implementing this transition. Even better would be a reduction of high-level management so that resources can go where they're needed most, on the front line. Again, I really appreciate the time, thought, and effort of all involved. It's been a fast and top-heavy process with minimal input from frontline workers. So I'm not surprised that an extra layer of management is where this proposal has landed. Jenny O'Connor. Yes, hi, my name is Jenny O'Connor. I'm a Portland citizen and property owner. I'm also, I'm speaking for myself as a citizen, but I'm also a member of the 350 Watchdog Team and a member of the Emerging Coalition on climate and, uh, of climate and environmental groups. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the work that's been done and say thank you to all of you. I'm gonna leave it at that. I, I, I'm impressed. Um, my point one is I support Commissioner Mapp's amendment on the national uh, natural resources as outlined. I, I ditto um, Bob Salinger's remarks. Um, I liked it because the scope of work was outlined. It had tasks, it had a timeline, and it also had public uh, involvement, which uh, Commissioner Ryan's didn't. So therefore, I'm opposing Commissioner Ryan's amendment, and I support Commissioner Mapp's amendment. I, let's see, I'm, I'm opposing Commissioner Rubio's Amendment 1 to amend exhibit to add Chief Sustainability Officer. There's been over a thousand comments that have come in asking for a climate officer to be added at the top level under the city administrator. There's been a lot of thought, a lot of thought that's gone through this. We are, we're, uh, uh, where we were, we got the idea from Kings County, who's already done this, and we have a scope of work for them to implement the climate emergency. And this is to your legacy, Mayor Wheeler, because you uh, declared that we have a climate emergency. Then BPS did a really extensive look at all the things we have to do to get to uh, zero emissions by 2050. Nobody has talked about this, none of you. And um, I want to see a climate officer added to the administ chief administrator's office at the top level. Is that what your amendment that's does? That I think that's what an amendment that's, does. That's no, better. she's saying that you're gonna take the chief sustainability officer, Vivian, who's already managing and already has her, her plate full. If you look, and we looked at the um, job description of your chief officer, your chief sustainability officer, and we looked at the job description of the climate officer that Kings County hired last year. Big difference, big difference. And if you guys are gonna do your homework, then look at that. And I'm saying this because a lot of us came up with this idea. It wasn't a climate officer. It wasn't to replace Vivian and put a chief sustainability officer up there. It's to hire a new climate officer at the top level. You know how far we are into this? I do. Okay. Well, 92% remaining I see sure, on 47 tasks. Well, I. I really sincerely appreciate what you're saying, and I don't think we're far off. I think our intention, actually I know, our intention was to be responsive to what community was saying. So I think that there's a way for us to close that gap. Um, we, we're happy to talk to you afterwards. There's still room for us to shape things going forward. Yeah, no, I'd love to talk to you, because I have, I, I've been, <laughs> I've been thinking about this for two weeks. Okay, but just know that our intention is there. It's not to then subvert, why is, we're in alignment. Then why is there no one assigned to oversee the climate emergency work plan? This is who, this position would be doing that for the whole city, as well as overseeing the new climate commission that we're about to start. So you're gonna take Vivian's job of all that and you're gonna add this on top of that, our goal is to add capacity so that we are 
hopefully moving into position to be a I'm climate sorry. leader. I'm getting really upset, and it's really you know, not it's not a good thing. Okay, well, we, we can always agree to disagree. That's a we democracy. Can, Commissioner can, Gonzalez? I, mean, I just, guess so, but... Can I just clarify one piece here? So I think part of the confusion is the header on the amendment versus what the amendment actually does. The amendment adds a chief sustainability officer in the city administrator section of the organizational chart, similar to the equity officer. The, I think where the confusion is coming is that is the header says moving Ch chief sustainable officer to city administrator. So the body, the intent is to create a new position. Yeah. And, and I'm going to put an asterisk on this just to be clear, but I think the clear intent is to create a new position that has parity with the chief equity officer. Just the header says, the header is confusing. Uh, so I recognize the grounds for your confusion. I would back up what Commissioner Rubio is saying. The intent here is to create a new position that ha that sits at the chief administrative officer's direct report level, as senior as you get. I say all that with the caveat that I'm going to repeat a number of times, and I said it yesterday, we still have to go through the budget process. So regardless of what we do today, we have to go through a separate process to figure out how we're going to pay for all of this overhead, as a number of folks have testified to. So just trying to reconcile where there might be yeah. some confusion on this. Now I feel kind of stupid because it's almost like, you know, I didn't understand it right. Hey, well, we didn't help. Position. We didn't help you with the heading, and that's my apologies you didn't, for you. You said you were going to move the chief, and so I took that literally. So sorry about that. Not, not, a, not at all. And and while you're here, just so I can be clear, and maybe Michael, you can answer this later. I think in addition to the budget, don't we have to bring the definitions of the positions? Do we need positional authority, yeah. which means we actually have to have a public discussion about the specific duties in those positions. Is that accurate? New classifications have to come to council. And would this be one? I think so. Okay, so it's very likely we'll we'll have a more in-depth conversation about the specific duties of this position. So would you consider looking at King County climate sure. officer yeah. job description? Yes, and you can talk to my office and me directly. Yeah, no, I'd love to. One more point, as I was look, listening to all you yesterday, I thought, you guys should hire from within. You've got a lot of talent, a lot of talent. I, I know I work for the Department of Public Works in San Francisco. I work at different levels. I left as a project manager. I know what the problem with budget comes with. I would say look at your, you know, what, the talent you have within your uh, organization and, and elevate. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you Sorry both. for the uh, That was a good discussion. No, it was a good, uh, very good discussion. I learned a lot, too. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Micah Meskel online, followed by John Turan and Dan Handelman, Portland Cop Watch. Hi, Micah. Hi, Mayor, Council. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Micah Meskel, Assistant Conservation Director for Portland Audubon. I'm going to keep my testimony um, brief as I and the general public have had limited time to review the proposed amendments, but um, I'll start broadly. Um, I urge, and Portland Audubon urges you to ground your decisions today on optimizing future function instead of the politics of today. Um, and uh, yeah, the key piece is um, we believe that the formation of a natural resource group could be very beneficial towards the holistic protection, stewardship, and expansion of our environmental assets in the city. We have long been in this position um, for 40 years, um, really advocating for the holistic um, treatment of all those as they will bring synchronization um, among these efforts. And so today we're in support of MAPS Amendment Number 1 to allow for the further ongoing discussion and collaboration between bureaus. Um, it's been ongoing and we want it to continue about how to best organize the city's environmental programs, um, including recreation, and how the new groups can maximize their joint goals. We're planning on continuing to follow that discussion and the development of this group to help inform it. Um, and taking a, a real watership approach to um, a watershed approach to um, its work. Um, I'll note that there's a lot of grassroots community support for this model um, that we've heard over the years and um, for this um, session today, and that you've seen in the public record. record. 
Um, we do not support Ryan Amendment number one on structural level, though we agree with the goal um, and think it can be achieved through the ongoing discussion of the city's natural resource group. We're dedicated to continuing to advocate for the achievement of retaining a strong connection between parks, natural areas, recreation, and people. And lastly, um, I, we support the placement of the chief climate officer in whatever position that will empower it the most to really coordinate the city's entire efforts towards building climate resilience. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks, Micah. John Turan. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Turan, longtime uh, downtown Portland resident. Uh, I'm here to urge a, a no uh, vote on the city re reorganization chart. Um, before I go into that, I was I just wanted to clarify, is it, is it correct that the mayor uh, currently has administrative responsibility for the entire city? No. Okay. Uh, I have some of the administrative bureaus under my responsibility, but commissioners, in addition to their legislative and budgetary authority, they also have direct management authority for bureaus that are assigned to them. Okay. I, I so I have some of the some of the uh, managerial authority, but I don't have all of it. Okay, I thought I thought I read in the paper that you were going to take over uh, administration of all the bureaus. Oh, that well, that could be the case. Oh, under okay. the current under the existing charter, I have the ability to move bureaus, including taking them all back and putting them under myself. I have that authority. Okay, and and, and you also still would do the policy making. Is is, is that correct? It depends if it's budget or. Uh, if it's general city policy um, or legislative authority, that resides with the council as a whole under the current city charter, and there's nothing I can do to take that authority away. Okay, and uh, how big is your staff? Well, we have 21, 22, okay. 22. Yeah, um, so I, I, I'm just kind of reiterating some of the same points uh, that everybody else has been made, but I do feel like this new organization chart is bloated. Um, if you give each of the city administrators an assistant, um, it counts to about 28 to 30 people to do just the administration portion um, that they're proposing. Um, I also think that the uh, shared administration is a bad idea. Um, I think you could determine the shape of legislation merely by like the phone calls that come in. And with the way that the uh, organization structured, essentially the city administrator would get notice of any messages that came into um, you know the counselor's office before the uh, before the counselor even got it, because you know the admins, their uh, the city administ administrators, their boss. On top of that, um, the city administrator gets to set the legislative calendar which to me is a, is a policy-making function, um, you know, the sequence that you set out legislation to be, um, be heard. And so I, I think that's a really dangerous consolidation uh, uh, underneath that organizational chart. Uh, also point out 1.1 of the charter reform says it's the duty of the new uh, council to uh, set this um, structure. And so I feel like we're setting up the new or interim city administrator for failure. And you know we could be hiring all these people, decide that it's not uh, correct, and end up sending them back home. And my final point uh, would be to save a little bit of money on construction costs. Um, instead of chopping up uh, the current offices, uh, I would suggest moving all of the non-elected employees over to the uh, Portland building. And uh, you know, taking yeah, the city attorneys have one whole floor. Um, plus you have the elections office, and I think that could be uh, sufficient space, at least way cheaper, uh, to get everybody at home. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And, and by the way, we are restacking the Portland building with bureau offices that are currently in private sector leases. We're, we're looking at that very strategy you suggest. I think it's a smart one. Commissioner Gonzalez. I, I appreciate your comments, share your concerns on cost. Uh, we'll get into each of them. But I want to clarify one piece. You indicated this CEO, this city administrator would set the legislative calendar? Yes. Uh, I think it's on uh, page two, um, probably about like six bubbles down. I think it's where there's a scheduling. Uh, he, they, they get to set the calendar. I. Does Is there have... or someone come on? I just want to clarify one piece. I don't want to get sidetracked, but 
Is that okay with you? Is there a way we could pull the timer? I just. I'm sorry. What? What? What's the question? I, I think uh, it, it, it was Mr. Gonzalez. That's the. Who sets the legislative calendar under the new system? I, I assume like when council meets and that kind of stuff, is, uh, sir, is that what you mean? Correct. The council sets their own legislative through the Through the president's through the, office, correct? Through the president. Council president. Do you have your um, exhibit A? I think, the, I, I'm going to guess as you pull it up, if you, I think you're referencing that there is a scheduler position that is inside the bureaucracy that ultimately reports the CAO, but I, that is distinct from who actually sets the legislative calendar. I, I, I think that's a legislative function to set your calendar, even if there is someone called the scheduler somewhere in the bureaucracy. Okay, I, I, and I, I guess that would make more sense to put that bubble <laughs> underneath the president of uh, the council. Uh, yeah, we can, we can clarify if, that, if the exhibit's not clear on the functions of the president. Is, is that the question? That the exhibit might not be? I think if you go to the tab for legislative, just okay, go down. Um, sorry, I don't want to get us too far down a rabbit hole. I just want to here. clear on the, here. I'm doing it anyway. Right. I'm <laughs> I was about to jump into. Yeah, so uh, the third column, uh, fifth bubble down, council operations and legislative process. <laughs> right. so, what, what's the so to, to me, that, 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 that seems like uh, policy making, and that should be couched underneath the uh, president of, of the council rather than the city administrator. And it's, it's concerning that like my admin staff, who will be getting all my phone calls, um, whose boss is the city administrator, uh, is also the one setting the, setting the calendar. It feels a little bit like policy making. And Shoshana, the, the specific point I was jumping on is who sets the calendar for the new legislative function. I believe that is the president under the proposed code language we've read, but I, I but want to reconcile that. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Tate White, um, strategic project manager for the record. Hi, good afternoon. It is confusing. There's a lot of nuance. Um, yesterday in the work session, we talked about the shared council staff mm -hmm. who report to council staff director. Because they're shared, we couldn't really pick a single council member for them to report to, and so that's why you have that council staff director who also helps serve all the counselors and supports communication between the council and the executive. You're right that that director ultimately reports to the city administrator. That's what we had to do to have that permanent staff so that they don't change over each time there's an election. Gotcha. However, we note your concern and we'll make sure to put in tools to make sure that there's some space between the city administrator and that staff. Awesome, thank you. Great. And, and now I'm beating a dead horse, but who is, in your understanding, who is setting the legislative calendar in the new form of government? That would ultimately be the council, and the council president yeah. would have that authority. Just want to be crystal clear. Thank yes, you, definitely. and okay. thank you for this dialogue. Commissioner okay. Maps, and I, I will be very brief here. I appreciate the comments, uh, um, and even I appreciate the conversation. Um, I think this does point to a tension, and maybe um, some distance we have from best practices around uh, building an error gap between executive branch staff and legislative branch staff. So for example, I, if you go through the testimony that we received today, um, I think there is some, and even today, I think we heard someone say this, and if you check the paper that came in, uh, you'll also find examples of uh, our voters telling us that um, basically uh, council staff shouldn't report to the chief administrative officer because the chief administrative officer um, is part of the executive branch as opposed to the legislative branch. This would be like, uh, Staff in the in Congress reporting to the White House somehow. I think there's something there. I, we're not going to resolve this question today, but I, I'll I'll put that out there as something that we might want to think about before we're done with this process. Understood. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colleagues, could I suggest we get through the rest of public testimony because I, I know there's some people who have to get home to their kids with the, the school strike. Let's get through the testimony, make notes of things you want to follow up on, and we'll follow up at the end. Next up, we have Dan Handelman. Welcome. 
Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Wheeler and members of council. I'm Dan Handelman. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a member of Portland Cop Watch and a former member of the Police Accountability Commission. The PAC's work ended when we presented a plan to you on September 21. It's not 100% clear how much the resolution you're adopting today will be able to undergo further changes. As a group focused on police accountability, we're deeply concerned that the new oversight system is proposed to be under the same deputy city administrator as the police bureau. Um, this is not in the uh, slides that you were show shown. It's in the mayor's amendment. It's buried on page 19 of the memo from the chief administrative officer. Um, it was not the recommendation of the PAC, nor is it consistent with the charter to put the new board into the community safety division. The charter section 2-106 clearly indicates the new board will be independent of all other city offices. Just last year, when the independent police review was released from the auditor's office, they became an independent agency not linked to any other office. In 2001, when IPR was created, it was put into the auditor's office, although then Mayor Vera Katz had taken the older system, PIIAC, into her portfolio. She recognized that the police commissioner should not also manage the oversight system. Mayor Wheeler also recognized this challenging part of the existing system when council heard appeals from the Citizen Review Committee, and he was asked, as police commissioner, to weigh in on decisions previously made by the Bureau. There seems to be some misunderstanding of what the new charter says. I read it carefully because there was a discussion at a PCCP meeting a few weeks ago where it was asserted the new mayor will also be the commis police commissioner. That's not what the charter says. The mayor will hire and the employees of all the bureaus will report to the administrator and their deputies. At Portland Cop Watch, uh, we urge the council to add an amendment that makes it clear the new board will be independent and will not report to the same administrator as the police, or else you will risk perpetuating the distrust that has existed ever since before the PIIAC was created in 1982, the appearance that the police are the ones who investigate other police. If uh, you want a suggestion, the city operations area where the Bureau of Human Resources will be located for the new board. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. The next three testifiers are Jenna Kane online, Kyle Johnson, and Bab Spinelli online. Welcome. Go ahead, Jenna. Thank you. Uh, dear council members, thank you for your intentional work to facilitate a smooth transition to a new form of government with a substantially increased council. I'm testifying today to ask for your support to adopt Commissioner Maps' amendment number one, to restore a new Bureau of Natural Resources and come up with a natural resources plan by uh, September 30th, 2024, um, and to have a facilitated discussion with a rich uh, public engagement process, um, and to ensure that funding streams are uh, assured for uh, a Bureau uh, of this important magnitude. Um, my hope is also here, hearing the testimony through Parks earlier that um, that parks, it seems like, would be an integral part of a natural resources um, service area. And so I strongly um, would hope that these uh, bureaus would come together to really look at the public's good instead of what's politically feasible, um, to be able to work together uh, to protect um, the environment um, for Portlanders and future generations. The other aspect is that um, I too noted the um, incredibly inflated uh, top tier management in this proposed budget. And I have some concerns around the staffing impact for line staff um, at the city. And to really keep that in mind as you look at the groupings of the service areas to ensure that, you know, rather than allowing politics to dictate. Uh, what's the best for the public is to really keep the good of the public in mind, as well as um, protecting staffing positions at the line staff level. Um, I'd like to also add the importance of focusing on equity. Um, and I'm glad that you have an equity officer at the highest level. And I'm saying that um, in addition to um, relying on that position, ensuring that that position is well integrated and has the authority across bureaus, that the same is true for hiring a new climate officer um, in the city administrator's office. That's in integral to being able to address the climate emergency work plan and um, to make sure that we make progress instead of being steeped in the status quo and in action um, as far as the climate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenna. Next up is Kyle Johnson. 
Mayor Wheeler, uh, Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Kyle Johnson, and I'm uh, the Vice Chair of Bike Cloud, although today I'm speaking for myself. I've been a transportation advocate in Portland for the past 15 years. During that time, I started Portland's bike train movement and the largest bicycle valet in North America. Uh, and I've also helped get several important transportation projects over the finish line. As of this morning, I have also stood in front of a street grinder to prevent a bike lane from being removed. Over these past 15 years, we have never experienced uh, what is going on right now in terms of the city actively seeking to remove bike lanes. Uh, as you talk about how our government should function under the new charter, I hope that you'll consider a less centralized and less politicized transportation decision-making structure that is more accountable to the policies City Council passes. The Broadway bike lane scandal has tarnished Portland's reputation, both within the city and globally. Most importantly for this council is the damage that has been done to the relationship of trust between this council, PBOT staff, and all Portlanders. City Nerd is the most popular transportation planning YouTube channel. In it, city planner Ray Delonte gives his take on different cities. In his recent video about Portland with over 300,000 views, he dedicated an entire section to the Broadway scandal. At the end, he said something that I think captured what people felt when they read Director Williams' emails and the veil was lifted on how these life and death decisions are being made. In his video, he said, planners are doing years of extensive outreach to every impacted community, but if a rich business owner wants to take out a bike lane, they can just take a city council member out to a nice lunch. I can't even imagine how demoralizing this is for staff. All I can say to them is try to remember why you got into planning in the first place. I'd like you to all consider what would have happened if Director Williams' emails had not been leaked by her own staff. The sudden nighttime removal of the Broadway protected bike lane without any public engagement would have been unprecedented in North American history. The closest example is when Rob Ford was elected mayor of Toronto and removed a bike lane. Canadian cyclists laid on the ground to stop the grinder from removing the paint and it was international news. Well, now we have that in Portland as well. To rebuild trust, we need a transportation system where decisions are made in accordance to the policies and plans this council adopts. No one should question whether a decision was made because a wealthy landowner might take a council member out to lunch. I hope you will take seriously how we can avoid a scandal like this from ever happening again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Bab Spinelli. Hello, all. My name is Bab Spinelli, 75-year-old lifelong Portland resident. Just a reminder that we seniors vote. I don't know about all of you, but my head is spinning uh, trying to assimilate all the information that's come in today. I am going to stick with my original plan testimony, just with a couple of caveats. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I sent emails to Michael Jordan and his team, and to all of you, uh, Mayor Weaver and council members uh, last week. Thank you, Mayor Weaver, and Ms. Matt for responding to my email. Um, that being said, I am passionate about, well, back up. <laughs> First of all, in general, I support the organizational chart as it stands today. Um, and I have just a couple of caveats. Uh, I am passionate about, number one, a climate officer being added to the executive leadership team under the city administrator. Number two, a standalone natural resources bill. Now, several people that I would set have um, supported uh, your one agreement today, Commissioner Map, and I too applaud you for uh, bringing that to the table. However, since I have nothing to lose, I'm going to stick with my original testimony, which was to say, let's get a natural resource bill now rather than later. Okay, uh, and as Michael Jordan pointed out. This whole process is stupid fast. He said that also yesterday. Um, I implore all of you, please do not give up. You can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Babs. Next up, we have Diane Miesenhelter, Lynn Handlin, and Isaac McLennan online. Welcome.
Go ahead, Diane. Um, I'm going to also hear a little bit saying that um, I think these last minute amendments need more public scrutiny and it would be better to vote on them at a, at a future meeting after hearing public testimony. The latest reports from the world's best climate scientists state that climate change is happening faster than anticipated and we have until 2029 now to reduce emissions by at least 50% or face unthinkable consequences. To reach Portland's climate goals, XRPDX supports a chief climate officer that would be part of the new administrator's office and the city's executive leadership team. The climate officer needs to have the authority to develop the necessary budgets, adequate external funding, and oversee the implementation decisions in the realms of climate, natural resources, environment, and sustainability across the various bureaus. We support the restoration of a Bureau of Natural Resources. And so I'll say I support um, MAPS Amendment 1 and do not and oppose Ryan's Amendment 1 that will create and implement a plan for the protection of the city's natural resources as a buffer against climate change, reducing emissions, and for community health and well being. This Bureau should undertake policies around climate change mitigation, adaptation, restoration, ecological resilience strategies with respect to how climate change will affect our natural resources and vice versa. We support a version of the Climate Sustainability Committee at the administrative executive level that will be more open to community involvement and input with working groups involving representatives of local climate organizations actually taking on research development and plans for actions to move things forward quickly through a coherent strategy in collaboration with a climate cabinet, cabinet of city bureau representatives. All of this should be accomplished within a climate justice and equity framework with involvement and input of a diverse body of citizens who have worked on climate advocacy. The transition to this new government will uh, be a distraction to the timeline we have. So together, like the citizen-led campaign for PCEF, we can succeed alongside a city leadership planning for just and effective responses to expected climate disruptions and trying to mediate and reduce emissions so that we don't have the worst case to prevent the worst case scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Handlin. Hi, my name is Lynn Handlin. Um, thanks for letting me be here and talk. I appreciate this is a huge task you all had. Um, and like everybody else, the last minute-ness of some of it is a little disconcerting, but understandable. Um, so I, first of all, I'm very much in support of MAPS, the MAPS Amendment 1 to establish a, the natural resource department, whatever it is, onto the chart. Um, we need this very badly, uh, in part, and the Bureau needs that this Bureau or whatever we're going to call it needs to have real authority to do stuff and work with other bureaus in part to prevent things like the division street debacle debacle when Peabot and the water Bureau refuse to talk to each other. And now the people in my part of town, outer East Portland have a worse heat Island situation than ever we got concrete instead of trees so to prevent that let's do this um and reject i'm i'd like you to reject the ryan amendment it's a weak last minute inadequate you know i think that the goals are good but it is it's let's go with the maps amendment one um so to date the city has made a serious lack of progress on climate and in some areas, we've gone backwards in terms of climate justice, um, things like allowing and encouraging the expansion of dangerous polluting fossil, uh, not fuel storage in general and transportation in the CEI hub. We've lost tree canopy in areas like Outer East Portland. This is just part of how the city is sliding backwards instead of going aggressively forwards. Um, I very much support having a city climate officer a little bit confused about the interaction earlier because I also thought that when um, Commissioner Rubio said, "Oh, we have one. We're just promoting them up to the to be under the new manager." So I want the the, the new climate officer to be in addition to the planning and sustainability officer. I don't I don't want those combined. And I maybe I'm confused about how all that happened. I would I would like some clarification on it if at all possible. Um. 
I think I've run out of time, so uh, thank you. Thank you. Isaac McLennan. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, hello again, and commissioners. Uh, Isaac McLennan, Portland Firefighter Association President, uh, a firefighter for over 20 years and a resident of the Roseway neighborhood. Uh, I address you here on this point uh, only because I'm concerned about the overall cost of this transition, specifically on uh, how we're going to find the funds in order to transition the city government into the, what the voters passed. And I completely understand the, the task before you is uh, monumental, and I know that you all can do it. This council is by far the right council to, to take us across this uh, this bridge, um, but the voters did not pass the uh, re a reduction in public safety, and I'm concerned that when the bill comes for this transition, uh, it's going to be we're going to look for how we can come find the money to do that. And in times in the past, we've gone through budget cuts. Uh, we just cannot continue to cut the budget. Uh, we know the number one priority to reduce the overall cost, specifically in fire, is to hire more firefighters, and that ultimately reduces the cost of overtime. So I'm concerned only, and I want to make sure it, I just address you all so that you hear those concerns. Um, public safety should not be on the table to find money to support this transition. Voters did not pass this transition knowing that it would cost them uh, a reduction in public safety. So with that, I'll yield the other 40 seconds. Thanks for my time. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Sherry Spock, Bob Weinstein, and Terry Prig rigsby Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners for giving us time to make comments today. My name is Cherie Spock, and I work for 350 PDX, which is a environment and climate justice organization here in Portland. And we've been doing a lot of the organizing around the climate officer position, and so appreciate the uh, intention to make sure that that uh, outcry from the public is heard, and so we want to make sure to work on making that something that is going to work really well for this city. I think the main thing that we want to emphasize is that in this moment where we have this historic opportunity to reorganize the ways that we structure the, the city and the ways that we work together, we want to make sure that climate is really emphasized in there. This is going to be the number one thing that all of our bureaus and service areas are going to have to deal with in addition to the normal things that everybody's had to deal with in the past, but it's going to get more and more impactful as climate change, unfortunately, unfolds. So working cohesively across the city to make sure all of our climate, environment, and sustainability uh, initiatives and great goals happen and happen well and happen in a coordinated and cohesive way is really important to us. So first of all, we want to make sure that that climate officer position is there in the city administrator's office, that they're on that executive leadership team, and that they have that opportunity to make sure to work with all of the bureaus and service areas to coordinate well and to bring in climate to areas that maybe people haven't been paying attention to climate. And then second of all, we want to make sure that that is not removing the sustainability officer work that is also really important. So that's a whole job in itself. The new position would be a lot of work as well. So we want to make sure both of those positions still remain so that that can all happen well. Uh, we also support the work to make a natural resources plan. I think that fits in well with that idea of continuing to plan well how all of these functions work together well. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Weinstein. Uh, Mayor and council members, my name is Bob Weinstein. For the record, last year voters approved a new charter, not a blank check to expand bureaucracy. Projected annual costs are 13 million above current costs, 1,344% and 120% above the commission's low and high estimates of 0.9 million and 5.9 million provided to you in the public. Estimates for transition costs are nearing 20 million and counting, 66% and 13% above the commission's low and high estimates of 12 to 17.7 million provided to you, but unfortunately not provided to the public. 
during the election as part of its $190,000 effort to purportedly educate voters about the new charter, the city provided information online and in a flyer to all voters right here that had the, the estimated operating costs but completely omitted the 12 to 17 million in transition costs. The city rebuffed my effort to have this information provided to the voters. San Diego, Sacramento, and Seattle council members have nine, six, and four staff members respectively. While I know staffing levels will be up to the new council, the current proposal grossly <coughs> underestimates the cost of and understaffs the future council. Having any council member report to the city administrator is not appropriate, it's anti-democratic. There should be a separation of powers. Other cities, the state of Oregon, and federal governments all have legislative staffs report to the legislative body, not to the executive branch. It's basic part of our democratic fabric in this country. On June 29th, 2022, Commissioner Ryan raised the issue of conflict of interest with respect to commission members running in the first election under a system they designed, comparing it to hiring committee members who design a process and job description and then apply. Mayor, Mayor Wheeler later stated that if any members ran, it would be a campaign issue. Both of you are correct. Any new position appointments should be interim until the new city administrator can make permanent hires. Please engage citizens on whether millions in new bureaucracy is the best use of limited financial resources versus, versus investing in priorities like first responders, PBOT, and other pressing needs. Thank you. Thank I you, took sir. Walt Wheeler's extra time. He said I could have it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Terry Pre Grigsby. Uh, thank you for allowing us to uh, provide input today. I um, am a natural resource professional and I strongly support Commissioner Mapp's um, amendment to restore the uh, City of Portland's uh, Natural Resource Bureau and in particular to ensure that that's adequately funded and that that natural resource um, office or bureau has the authority to impact priorities and programs um, amongst other infrastructure bureaus. Um, however, I'm actually here today as someone with a disability and I, um, in looking at the proposed city restructure, um, I see that it completely lacks representation and programmatic support for people with disabilities as well as for our aging community. Uh, most major cities have aging and disability offices that are both visibly, um, easily visible and regularly engaged with the community. And the proposed Portland City restructure verifies that Portland views those of us with disabilities as well as our seniors as less important than our able-bodied and young citizens. Uh, the restructuring process is an opportunity to shift how Portland engages with and supports the disabled and aging community. And much like the proposed new Bureau of Natural Resources, I ask that the restructure create a centralized office that can um, support programs for our disabled and aging communities. Um, the current program located within the Office of Equity and Human right, re Rights is so under-resourced that it does little more than ensure basic compliance. And that not only leaves the city open for legal repercussions um, when bureaus are not in compliance, but it keeps the city from truly addressing the unique needs of our growing aging population and those of us with a myriad of disabilities across all ages, racial and gender identification, and socioeconomic status. Um, so this is a large area of opportunity for Portland to become a leader and I urge you to take this um, issue seriously and add it into the restructure. Thank you very Thanks. much. Appreciate it. Thanks, all three. Our next three testifiers are Kelly Yonspa, Debbie Iona, and Janice Thompson. I don't see Kelly. Let's. How about Debbie? Are you able to unmute? Hi, Debbie. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, I'm Debbie Iona, a former member of the Police Accountability Commission, and I'm speaking in that capacity today. First, I want to echo the concern you have heard about placing the new police accountability system under the same deputy city administrator as the police bureau. I've been involved with accountability issues for over 20 years and understand that there are community members who will not trust a system where the police and the oversight system are in the same section of the organizational chart. The chart you are considering today has an asterisk for Prosper Portland, noting that they report to the Prosper Portland Board. This structure is similar to the way the new Office of Community-Based Police Accountability will function by reporting to the Community Board for Police Accountability. For the police, investigations of misconduct and discipline are supposed to be handled by the new oversight board with no interference from other parts of the city. Other types of hiring, firing, and personnel matters will be up to the chief and the deputy administrator. It is not spelled out that the mayor would have any authority in those decisions. Mr. Jordan's memo seems to acknowledge this interpretation of how the system will work, even though it doesn't reflect the concern about the real or perceived conflict of interest. He wrote, there is a proverbial dotted line from the police bureau to the police chief. As the charter states that the police chief is appointed by the mayor and confirmed by council. The DCA of Community Safety will lead the, on day-to-day -day strategy and priorities of the Community Safety Service area, while ultimately the mayor will be held responsible for the success of the police chief in their role, end quote. So thank you for considering my comments. I do hope you'll think carefully about the importance of separating the accountability system from the police bureau so that we you know, uh, reassure our community members that the accountability system is truly independent. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Janice Thompson. Uh, Janice Thompson, I'm representing only myself. Um, I see this resolution as a vital step in responding to last fall's vote for major changes in city governance. To be clear, this plan is just a first step in wind unwinding the commission form of government that for over 100 years has contributed to inefficient and costly siloing of bureaus and political rather than professional management of city operations. That organizational changes are needed was demonstrated last August when the council agreed to streamline the development permitting process. As Commissioner Rubio said at the time, this effort kept faith with the voters who told uh, us, the council, loudly and clearly last November that a more responsive and coordinated city government is essential. I highlight uh, Commissioner Rubio's leadership um, due to its timeliness compared to several amendments before you today. I also support both of the Rubio amendments um, before you. Uh, but before I continue on the amendments, I want to stress that your vote today does need to be followed by budget um, decisions that adequately support this plan. Um, it's been uh, characterized as like too much bureaucracy, I think, what people need to realize, in my view, is that it's bringing Portland into the era of modern municipal uh, management with uh, not just a, an emphasis on vertical, but an important emphasis on horizontal management. So uh, clearly, I think the current council should not be surprised that early cost estimates frequently increase given the low confidence level uh, label typically applied, for example, to um, major construction projects. I would say that the CBO's um, initial cost estimates would have been appropriately labeled as being a very, very low confidence level. Uh, any notion that those initial estimate, estimates should be viewed as a cap is quite inappropriate, and I oppose the new uh, Ryan Amendment. Uh, regarding Mayor's Amendment Number 2, I concur with the concerns uh, by Dan Handelman and Debbie Iona. I see. Um, Pros and cons to both MAPS and uh, Ryan's amendment number one. However, I oppose both of them due to their 11th hour presentation. Rather, I would argue that these commissioners should um, 
compile their unfortunately siloed work to date and um, provide that information for the new uh, elected officials and new city administrator. Um, I don't support renaming the service areas. I see no advantage uh, to public safety over community safety. Vibrant communities is not consistent I'm, I'm with what sorry, I. You're almost a minute uh, over. Can you with I, you're, you're almost a minute yeah, over. Yeah, Can you just, wrap it up? yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, it's not consistent with what I think is a more appropriate use plain English approach. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate your thoughtfulness. Um, let me circle back. Kelly Janspa. Uh, our last testifier is Keith Edwards. Keith Edwards. That completes testimony. All right, very good. Uh, so I, I actually want to acknowledge something that was just said that's really important. None of this gets... Keith. Keith, is that you? Yeah. Oh, come on up. You got to yell. You got to yell. You got to have energy. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Thank you. You get, you get the last word. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, City Council. I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I hope that all the... Um, remarks that are given to you today, all the testimony is not um, fallen on deaf ears. Um, I hope we're not at the point we're not at the point of no return yet. So I hope that you consider what we have to share with you today. I am speaking generally to um, um, Amendment Four from um, Dan Ryan, and I want to talk about trying to put 12 pounds of rocks in a four pound bag. It's uh, rather difficult at best. I think you may have missed a mark when the citizens of the city voted to um, in, increase the size of the city council to 12 council members, including, not including the mayor. Because that message to me, what I heard, and what I also, when I voted in favor of that was that the city council would be closer and more accessible to each and every citizen. So it seems to me that you should be trying to consider putting a building, renovate a building and put it in every, in a central area in every district. So now the citizens can go there on bicycle, some of them can walk, and it's certainly more accessible. You don't have to do all four of them at once, you can do one at a time. Maybe it doesn't take six years to do all four of them. They can be done sequentially, and temporary housing can be put in the districts that aren't being renovated and um, completed before January 1 of 2025. But I think this is a way to look at all of our citizens being able to access and the environmental impact that you have of everyone trying to come down here, park, drive their car, whatever it is, to come to city council meetings. So I hope you take this in consideration. Remember, this is not the end of the day. This is the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and I'll, I'll pick up right where you left off. Um, did you have a well, question? Well, I just want to let Ryan? Mr. Edwards know, actually, I was the one that brought up that we needed to focus on having district offices ready when everyone came in. So it's already in motion. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. And it meets your budgetary issues as well. Exactly. Thanks. Uh, so I, I, I want to be really clear. Um, that our employers gave us a very clear directive, which is to have the new form of government as outlined in the new charter up and operational on January 1st, 2025. And as the gentleman leading that effort indicated, we are moving at a stupid fast pace. I concur. It's really important for people to understand we're not gonna get it right. This will be an evolutionary process. We want to have what we think is our best faith effort, understanding we are completely reworking Portland city government up and operational on January 1st of 2025. But we also freely acknowledge that changes will be made to this work at a later date. It's not going to work perfectly as it rolls out. And I expect the next council will have to do some follow-up work, some true-up work. Staff will have to continue to figure out where the most appropriate alignments are if we didn't get it exactly right. 
And so I, I just want to level set here and acknowledge that right up front. This, this is a very short timeline for the level of institutional change that is required by our employers. And so we're doing our level best. So um, th this isn't the end of the discussion. If something doesn't happen that you wanted to happen or if something happens that you didn't want to happen, there will be opportunities at future dates to be able to reframe, change, or evolve this structure. So I want to be really, really clear about that. So thank you for everybody who testified. It was interesting testimony. Um, a lot of good discussions were precipitated. At this point, we'll open up for discussion and votes on amendments, if that's okay with everybody. Oh, you know what? I promised a break. Uh, we'll take a 10-minute break. We should do that. It's 4.30. We'll reconvene at 4.40. We're in recess.
Things will now go through the amendments. I'm going to do my best to try and go through the amendments in the order in which they, they were offered up. Um, again, Wheeler 1 is first up. This is a technical amendment uh, in honor of our elementary school teachers who always taught us that it matters where the comma goes or where the bullet point goes. 
uh, legal counsel has informed me that we have an errant bullet point. So the motion to amend page two of Exhibit A to remove the bullet point in front of Impact Reduction Program, clarifying that the Impact Reduction Program is an independent entity separate and distinct from the Street Services Coordination Center reporting to the Portland Solutions Man. Uh, any further discussion on this amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. Wheeler 2. Um, this is the motion to amend Exhibit A to establish the Community Board for Police Accountability in the Office of Community Police Accountability. The oversight system is a standalone entity in the Community Safety Service area Jesus. reporting directly to the Deputy City Administrator for Community Safety. If anybody has further questions, we do have Robert Taylor here who can discuss this. This is somewhat related to the settlement agreement question as well. Yes? Will you check that your mic is on? Oh, sorry. Do I have to repeat all that? No, you don't want me to. Um, does anybody have any further questions on this particular amendment, Wheeler 2? Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Uh, the amendment passes. Uh, Rubio number one, which is moving the chief sustainability officer to the city administrator, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, Anything else you want to add? Any further discussion on this? Um, I just want to say for the record, the way I read this, and I believe the way that Commissioner Rubio intended it, is this is actually elevating this chief sustainability officer position. Yeah, it could to be the capacity and the position that should be reclassified, called whatever we need it to call it with expanded duties. Got it. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion on this item? Please call the roll on Rubio number one. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. Rubio 2, which is related to permitting and development. Any further discussion? Further nope. clarification? No. Please call the roll. Aye. Oh, sorry. Max. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. <laughs> Max. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The uh, amendment passes. Maps one natural resources. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I make some comments here? Please. Um, uh, number one, I, I want to express my appreciation for all the testimony we heard today. Um, I think we, over the past couple, several days, we've all probably received more than 100 letters and emails from folks who had opinions on this. Uh, frankly, I believe most of those emails have been in support of the proposal that I've brought forward. Um, Colleagues, um, I believe this is a common sense, um, a common sense good government proposal, which basically uh, suggests that this council continue the work that we ordered our staffs to do to uh, bring together our best thinking about how to um, do a better job of match managing our natural resources. Um, now, um, it's probably quite apparent to everyone in the room um, that we have two amendments that kind of abut each other and are in roughly the same space. You got MAPS 1 and then we got Ryan 1 or whatever uh, Commissioner Ryan's amendment is. As I see it, um, I don't think there's anything which is inconsistent with my proposal and what uh, Commissioner Ryan proposes to do. Um, Commissioner Ryan wants to stand up um, or Commissioner Ryan wants to move uh, resources, staff and, um, and services into a new trees and um, natural areas unit. Um, I have a lot of questions about the micro mechanics, the economics of that, um, which I will explore when we get to Commissioner Ryan's amendment. Um, nothing I'm proposing today precludes doing that. I will make it clear. I also think that it is too early today to um, uh, vote yes on Commissioner Ryan's uh, proposal, but I think that we can continue to have this discussion. Uh, today we've heard from a wide range of citizens and experts uh, who really have encouraged us to move in this space and I sure hope that we will. And if uh, any of my colleagues have any questions, I'd be happy to respond to them. So I, I have a comment, and it's based in part on the testimony we heard. Um, 
and, and maybe it's based on my own assumption that the reason we're having this conversation now, and this pertains to your amendment, it uh, pertains as well to Commissioner Ryan's amendment, is because of the organization chart discussion that we are having. And here's the concern I have. Um, as I read these, I got the impression, and I think people who testified got the impression that these are mutually exclusive. And I believe there is even staff here who believes that these are mutually exclusive. I would say and, com go, Commissioner, Ryan's, uh, or Commissioner Ryan's proposal precludes, and, would make some choices. That means that if you proceed my, my proposal, we wouldn't be able to have on the table let anymore. Let me expound on this just a bit. So with regard to your proposal, first of all, um, my understanding is that we are now in possession, like literally in the last 48 hours, of the draft report that you and your office and a number of bureaus have spent a considerable amount of time and energy putting together. Council has not yet even heard the final report. And uh, furthermore, um, we already have encapsulated in a previous resolution that we would bring this back to council by a certain date. That was uh, on under exhibit two of the resolution we passed, page 20 and 21. So that process is already underway. But what I, and, and I think we should let that process run its course. I'd, I'd actually like to see and read the final report before I make a decision. And on top of that, in this amendment as I read it, it is assigning the chief administrative officer the responsibility for landing this project in this calendar year. And I'm worried about that just in terms of capacity uh, because as he said so eloquently earlier, maybe it was even earlier today, a lot of things have been thrown over the fence. And, and I'm worried that something this important may not get the attention it deserves given the other duties currently assigned to that office. Um, Commissioner Ryan, we heard substantial, and we'll get to yours in a minute, substantial testimony on yours. There were a lot of people who liked it. Um, there were people as well who, who raised questions or concerns. And so I, I guess my question, and this may be for Michael, um, rather than either of you, is if we, you know, the, what's precipitating what I think is a premature conversation around the natural resources question is the org chart. If we were, and I'm just saying this for my own edification for a moment, if we tabled the discussion of the natural resources till we get the final report, till we have more information from both offices about what they're proposing, about whether these are in fact in alignment or in conflict, if we tabled that conversation and therefore it was not included in the org chart today, could it be included in the org chart later and if so, how? Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, um, I think what you're articulating is the very reason that we didn't put it on the org chart in the final version. And that's because we were expecting more information from the five bureaus that have been working on this conversation. It's an important conversation, really respect the work and want to take it into account. To the last part of your question, I think this council can make that change anytime they wish. Um, it gets complicated if you're trying to budget into the change. You get the financials on this, if in fact it is an all-encompassing kind of natural resources division or bureau, um, the, the, the financials will be a little bit complicated because the money currently comes from multiple sources to fund the programs that we're talking about. So can you do it? Yes. Will it be complicated if it's in out of sync with budget? Yes, but it doesn't well, mean you can't do and, it. And, and the reason I'm concerned about this, now I'll, I'll just confess to my own lack of knowledge. Um, I've got nothing to lose here as far as I'm concerned. Um, these exhibits are both meaty mm -hmm. and they deal with a very important subject that has been carefully studied by both of these commissioners and their offices and multiple bureaus for a long period of time, mm -hmm. but it's being brought to council right now in the last 48 hours because we're having this discussion around transition. 
And I feel like we're being shortchanged as a council in terms of the amount of information we have and the knowledge that we have the opportunity to develop. And I feel like the public is being shortchanged as well. We had some really smart people that I trust who are supporting Commissioner Ryan's. We had smart people who I trust supporting Commissioner Maps. But I have not even begun to read the 300-page draft report on Commissioner Maps proposal around natural resources. And, and from my perspective, if it's not critical path to the question today, which is the transition plan, I don't see why we need to shoehorn it into this conversation and give it a half-hearted effort. I think we need to understand the natural resources question thoroughly, but separately, if it can be re-injected into the, the process at a later time. Well, I think from the testimony today, uh, Mr. Mayor, you've heard that it's an important topic to the community. Okay, so I, you know, personally, um, just me, one vote out of five, I would table both of these amendments, but that's just me. But I'll leave it to my colleagues. Yeah, um, allow me to speak for a moment, and I appreciate everything you said, actually. Uh, yeah, might as well stay there. Um, the reason we didn't have an amendment Nice try, Michael. The reason we didn't have an amendment until, as you say, the last 48 hours is because we knew about this process and Parks was heavily engaged in it. I'd actually like to hear from Director Long and Todd about um, what, what they could add to this conversation, which I think would be really helpful. I do have a question for you, Commissioner Maps. Yes. Um, you, you're right, there was, a, there was a campaign of letters that came in, yeah. and there was a lot of testimony today in support. Almost 95% of them spoke of the new bureau that you're building. You then said, that's not true. It's time for you to be on the record because all of the supporters that came today and in the letters all spoke to a new bureau. Sure, uh, Commissioner Ryan, thank you um, for that question. To be clear, what I'm proposing in my amendment is that we continue the planning process that we've had, well, that we've had amongst our five bureaus. Um, I know if you're a layperson, it's, it's easy to kind of uh, uh, reduce that to setting up a bureau. So also an artifact of the way this conversation has been structured in that we have to put something on the org chart in order to have a continuing discussion around that. I don't think we've been particularly well served by this. One question you have to answer is where does this discussion actually kind of physically happen? But just as Commissioner Ryan, your uh, your amendment so, so calls wait. for the creation you, of a did you answer the question? management unit. I don't know if you actually mean to stand up a whole new unit there, a whole new bureau in that space. You know, I see you're shaking your head no, so I suspect that these are artifacts of language and artifacts of the way uh, conversations get framed in a public discourse that have uh, confused you a little bit. They're not, no, what's confusing to probably anyone that's been paying attention is that the letters, again, that came in, the testimony today, and support of your amendment was all about a new bureau. So I just wanted to hear you on the public record say sure, that I, I, is not, even though your supporters came, many of them to say that, you're telling the supporters that came today that's absolutely not the case. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, I appreciate your uh, curiosity about uh, natural uh, areas and how to manage them. Uh, what we've been trying to do um, in this building over the last year or so is have to enter bureau conversation about how we can do a better job of managing our natural uh, areas. Uh, that could be manifest manifested through the creation of a new bureau. It could be manifested through reassignment of responsibilities. It could be manifested through new IGAs. It could be manifested through the city getting out of certain uh, lines of business. It could be manifested through the city getting into new lines of business. Um, Commissioner Ryan, what I am proposing is that we continue this important conversation. Um, and I think if you look at the, the language that I put forward, especially in the where, uh, no, in the now therefore, or be it further resolved, that's exactly what I call for. And if you'd like, I could read it for you, but I think I've already read it for you one time. I, I, I'm fine. I just wanted you to be on record because I thought it was confusing for the people to, who came to support. Judge, just want to be clear. Are you clear? Uh, do you understand what I said? Right, and actually, maybe it would be helpful so we don't have to make everyone go through this over and over again. What is it you're under, what's your understanding of what I just said, just so the record can be clear, because I know you care about this moment. What I understand is that based on the campaign and everyone who's sent in letters, which you mentioned earlier, that, you, that they were in support of your amendment, and the people who came to speak today, many of them, seem to be expecting a new bureau. So 
me sitting up here wanted to have better understanding of that. I brought up uh, Director Long because they have been participating in this uh, work because it was asked of them to do that, which dates, uh, predates all of us, what goes back to uh, Commissioner Fish when he had both BES and parks. So just trying to level set. Sure, so Commissioner Ryan, transparent. Commissioner Ryan, just for clarity's sake, what question is it that you're, you're trying to pose to the Parks Bureau at this moment? Well, right now they haven't had a chance to, I, we will pivot to that. I was just asking you to be on record to say, your amendment is not about building a new bureau of My amendment natural resources. is about continuing the conversation about how we can work together as a city to do a better job of okay. managing our natural Exhibit resources. Uh, there are many different dimensions to that, both how we can do that and just as there are many different dimensions to what constitutes um, natural resources. Great. Well, welcome. Isn't this fun? So um, I think it'd be great for you all to just uh, give some context to the good work that you've been doing with all of your other bureau colleagues. Certainly, on thank natural you. areas. I appreciate that, um, Mayor Wheeler. You referred to a 300-page report that you've that you just I, received. I think that, that came from right. Commissioner Mapp. I just I just wanted to clarify that the 300-page uh, report was product from the work that myself, Director Ujiyama and the other bureau directors from PBOT, BPS, and Water had undergone since uh, February, March of this year. Thank you. So it's not a report that necessarily supports a natural resource service um, uh, unit, organizational unit, but what I'd like to clarify is that it offers five opportunities for us to consider. There are five. The first one is to continue to do our work as is, but more equitably and better together. The second one was to consolidate urban tree canopy services. The third was to consolidate natural uh, area um, management. The fourth was to consolidate uh, watershed and green infrastructure uh, management. And the fifth was to create a natural resource organizational unit. What, the, what Ryan's Amendment 1, um, would, the proposal would accomplish is three of those five opportunities that have been that were presented in that recommendation. You are right. You have. We owe you a work plan, um, and uh, and but we do have five very coherent and very doable opportunities at at our. And, and director, to be perfectly clear, I, I'm not casting any aspersion on no, the report, I'm, and I, I'm sure it's great, and I look forward to reading it, and I would hope we have a work session on it as well when the final report. I just wanted to clarify that because I it's, I think it's important for the council to know even as we can sit, continue this conversation. Perfect. Thank you. I I, I do appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Director Long. Just so I understand uh, the. The proposal that Commissioner Ryan has brought forward. How should we think about that proposal in the context of this report? Has is it your position that the, that conversation has been complete, and now um, in that report uh, there's a recommendation which uh, Commissioner Ryan has chosen to move forward with, um, or is there more planning um, and discussion that you would anticipate that needs to happen amongst our five bureaus? I would say that, as I mentioned before, I would say that at least three of the opportunities that were identified would be addressed through that proposal. Um, I have been having this conversation with, uh, in particular with BES, who's quite frankly the, the, the other bigger player, right? Sure. Uh, since 2019. Sure. Uh, we did a lot of work together. Uh, we have I, I interagency agreements, we have MOUs, we have um, shared best practices, and, in, and we've created some great um, uh, organizational relationships. Um, one of the things that we did do is we identified, uh, in particular, tree canopy, urban forest tree canopy, as an area that could be consolidated under parks and recreation. That recommendation was never, never came to light, like was never implemented. Um, you'll also know, I'm sure you know, we recently um, uh, processed an interagency agreement around uh, approximately 11 properties um, that are jointly uh, managed between BES and parks and we're able to sort of identify uh, who should be doing what work. What I would like to add about um, the uh, Ryan uh, Amendment 1 is that we're talking about 
streamlining and aligning to our strengths. Parks and Recreation is um, managing over 8,000 acres of natural areas. We are managing 1.2 million park trees. Uh, the idea is that if we were to move forward with those, those three options in the middle, as it were, um, it would be addressing those two particular areas. The third, of course, is the area that I think gets held harmless, and that's BES's authority around uh, wastewater and stormwater and um, that work. Okay, uh, thank you. So I had another question. I'm glad that we have you here. Um, in the be it further resolved section of uh, Commissioner Ryan's amendment, he proposes aligning natural areas and tree management positions, funding, and services. Can you tell me how many positions uh, you're proposing to realign um, and where, which bureaus they would come from? That would be very difficult to say exactly. I do know that approximately 10 staff in BES are doing natural area work. I don't know the specifics of their classifications, what percentage of their time is spent on what type of work. But I also want to remind folks that we are talking about operational alignment. So there is a lot of uh, work that BES does now and will continue to do sure. around uh, the protection, preservation policy um, around the natural areas. And could I, do, could I sure. add, is that okay? I'm Todd Lofgren, Deputy hey, Todd. Director, uh, Portland Parks and Recreation. Uh, the amendment also is just to bring that idea for council's consideration during the budget process as well. And so there's not actually an organizational chart change. So the visualization is not changing on the uh, org chart, right? We will bring that back for council's consideration just like other considerations. And then just add uh, Mike Jordan's report, yeah. I think continues the conversation work. And so I think there's consensus, at least when we read it, uh, working in the bureaus, that that would uh, follow the intent of uh, your amendment. Okay, so I, yeah, actually, the, uh, now I'm not sure what this means. So there's language in the Ryan Amendment that says, all city bureaus shall align natural areas and tree management positions, funding, and services to an operational natural areas in tree management unit. Now, two questions. Number one, does that tree management unit already exist, or is that a new thing? Is it the operational natural areas of tree management unit? So that's already an existing thing. Okay. Um, so what, what is that directing us to do? To me, it kind of sounds like when we go to the next budget process, we're supposed to move some bodies, some dollars, and some programs into this new unit. That's correct? And so uh, you said there might be 10 bodies in BES. I was looking at this chart that pulled, to, do you know if any other bureaus would, might be involved in this space? So for example, I was looking at this graph that came out of uh, the study group and I, I was actually kind of surprised to see how many uh, PBOT dollars uh, go into the urban canopy space. Can you give me a sense of what um, this, what Ryan's amendment would mean for PBOT, especially in terms of staffing and funding? So I can just jump in. So we have interagency agreements already with some of these bureaus to do yeah. some of this work. Uh, for PBOT, uh, the interagency agreement for this past year was about $1.2 million. A little over a million of that went to urban forestry operations. A lot of that was emergency response for fallen trees in the right of way, as well as horticulture services where PBOT wanted to purchase trees. So beyond that, there might not be too much. There are some natural areas, to be frank, aren't actively managed by PBOT, sure. right? Because they're focused on the right of way transportation infrastructure as their core mission. but. For a variety of reasons in this form of government, we have natural areas that are spread around in different bureaus. So they have unserviced, uh, unmet service needs. So that would be a conversation of like, how would we have better trash pickup? Do we want to mobilize volunteers to help PBOT's uh, natural areas? Do we want to address nuisance behavior or other things that are happening in those natural areas that currently maybe PBOT doesn't have the resources today? So those would be the conversations that would be opened up by 
having kind of a one city approach to natural area management and tree management. So, um, so you're not saying here, uh, when you say align positions, funding, and services um, into this new parks unit, you're not necessarily saying that uh, we're talking about moving dollars or staff from, from PBOT? Well, it seems like we were with BES, but now we're not with right. PBOT. So PBOT maybe. right now, well, we understand, and this is why we need some time to work with the bureaus, okay. right, to have this proposal come back to you as during the budget process. Well, the and then also do community right engagement, now. right? So, like so we do minutes. the budget advisory committee reviews that all the bureaus would have for these proposals, and then it would come back for you. So it would give more time for public engagement around this idea. Mm -hmm. But there's at least an estimate of about $1.2 million, not FTE for these kinds of services from PBOT today. So about $1.2 million out of PBOT uh, that goes to parks, okay. They're currently expending those resources already, so this is really about a functional alignment. And so I heard a lot today about community members saying that they wanna have a one-stop shop for services that they understand. Sure. And so this would provide community members, volunteers, and others to yeah. say, hey, do I have a concern about a natural area in Portland? Is the beach not cleared up, you know, along a river? Is there, you know, some other activity that's happening? That would be this operational unit where we'd mobilize day-to-day, month-to-month resources. Meanwhile, the, the bureaus would still retain their regulatory and to, until we have a new form of government, an active city administrator, sure. their own budget decision-making authority to set these service levels. Sure. Great. Uh, one more question, colleagues, and then I'll let us uh, try to get home. I know people have kids at home. Um, one of the reasons why it's kind of hard for me to um, evaluate Commissioner Ryan's proposal is, of course, over in the BES space, um, the color of money matters in that uh, we were, we, because of the Anderson lawsuit, there are the funds that we, um, the funds that uh, we come in, that we bring in from ratepayers are limited in how we can be spent, even though we spend some of these on sort of natural areas. Can you give me a sense of how the Ryan Amendment intersects with the um, Anderson lawsuit. Do you understand sure. that? Sure. Okay. Um, so it's really important that ratepayer dollars go to the mission of water and the, the BES bureaus, yeah. what those missions are. And so we have legal review when we have these expenditures, just like we have these interagency agreements today between the Water Bureau and BES. Okay. And so we would go through that same type of process of any decision making that was made around using ratepayer dollars that we'd have legal review and of course those would be approved by city council as well. Okay, well unfortunately, I'm kind of voting on this today. I think I have the city attorney in the room. C can I ask the city attorney a quick question? I promise I'll keep it quick. And then maybe I have Dawn, my director in the room too. Is she online or is she in person? Oh there, hey Dawn, come on up. Hi Dawn. <laughs> I know Robert has kids at home, so I'm going to try to uh, ask him a quick question and then let him get back to his young person. Not the only one. Um, um, Robert, you probably should introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Robert Taylor, City Attorney. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question. We got Ryan One. I've been trying to figure out how uh, Ryan One um, interacts with uh, the Anderson lawsuit, which I have to live under. Um, do you understand that based on what you've read today? Can you, uh, or what you've seen in these amendments, do you understand the implications of this? I Thank you, Commissioner. Um, looking at both the MAPS One and the Ryan One amendment, the, the Anderson lawsuit and the settlement would apply to both of those the same way. And your point about the color of money is right. And so what Anderson essentially said is that um, water and sewer funds can only be spent for things that are reasonably related to the provision of water and sewer. And that's true regardless of how we organize the city under MAPS 1 or Ryan 1. Okay. Um, so cannot you, we, although I do spend some dollars, especially in the BES space for uh, green approaches to especially stormwater management, um, 
What would that mean to align those dollars into uh, into uh, parks? Do we, do we know? And this is an, a kind of an authentic question. I know I do lots of subcontracting with lots of different groups, but. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the facts matter and the specific expenditures matter. Yeah. And so once those come to council or once there's a plan to do that through an IGA, our office would get involved to review it. And, and the critical inquiry is whether it's related to water and sewer services. You can't use those funds to do other things outside of that. That's the big lesson from that lawsuit. I got it. Thank you so much. And uh, we also, colleagues, have the director of the Bureau of Environmental Services, uh, Don, here. Uh, uh, well, Don, uh, please introduce yourself, and I might have a question or two for you. Good afternoon, City Council. Don Uchiyama, director of the Bureau of Environmental Services. Uh, what would you encourage uh, this council to think about as we consider uh, the MAPS amendment and the uh, Commissioner Ryan amendment? Uh, uh, council, I think that you should uh, absolutely um, approve a MAPS MAPS Amendment 1, and I completely disagree with Commissioner Ryan's uh, amendment. Um, I am I'm kind of shocked that we're at this point uh, after spending the last uh, nine months looking at a work plan, developing uh, relations with community, thinking about all of the um, overall work that we need to do together to be in, crammed in this point, trying to make this decision in the last minute. Uh, we have uh, an, an, a more analysis that needs to be done. We have more engagement that needs to be done. That's what we've promised our, our uh, constituents. And, and I think we need to make good on that promise of doing that work plan. Uh, we also, uh, BES needs to consider how we are using ratepayer dollars, the legal implications, our, our um, uh, regulatory requirements. So that analysis have, has not been done, and we should not be making this decision in, in such haste. Uh, we have a work plan, uh, and it's, it's uh, built on the work plan we did for the um, development services work in, in permitting, and uh, we have a promise to work with our stakeholders and have a process that they can follow and contribute and weigh in on. This is a topic that Portland cares deeply about, and it's part of our identity, it's part of our recovery, and it's not something that we should be doing uh, in, in such haste. So I, I uh, support Commissioner Mapps, your amendment, and uh, speak uh, very strongly uh, for support of us uh, uh, com continuing on the path of the work plan and, and answering to the chief administrative officer and, and working with our community um, to help uh, have them help guide us. Uh, thank you, Director. And in, in fairness, I'd like to give the Director of the Parks Bureau an opportunity to respond to uh, some of the feedback that we just had. Uh, Director, do you have anything you'd like to add? Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Yeah, um, um, Dawn is right. We've been working uh, hand in glove uh, since February, and like I mentioned, uh, together as bureaus since at least 2019. Um, having these conversations. Um, I think there's more conversation to be had. I do believe that uh, Ryan One's amendment um, is solid, um, and I believe that, as I mentioned, it is one of the opportunities that has been identified. Um, I, I do believe that uh, many of the nuances can be worked out and um, be considered, and it doesn't preclude continuing to have conversations with stakeholders, both internal and external. Can I add one thing, Commissioner yes, Maps? Please do. I, I just want to add that I feel like um, uh, peeling off uh, the Park Bureau into a sixth service area and then uh, putting this proposal of natural resources is antithetical to the way that we've been working. We're trying to bring uh, our work closer together. We're not trying to peel off and do things on our own. Uh, my understanding is, is this, this transition was supposed to bring us together and help us organize services in a way uh, that, that uh, looked at new ways of working, not peeling off and doing things uh, independently. Um, and, and so I, I think the Ryan proposal is uh, uh, in opposition of the spirit of the transition. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director. I know it took some courage to uh, um, say all of that, and I know I've taken up a lot of um, space and oxygen right now, so I'd like to give my uh, friend and colleague, Dan Ryan, an opportunity to say a few words. I appreciate that you both came up. Thank you. Um, I definitely would like to say that we are working as one city. And when we found out that this amendment was coming up, I just looked to my bureau at Parks to say, I thought we've been working together as a team. Can you please make your case? And then that's why they brought the amendment. 
So I think we both are saying the same thing. I think so. Yeah. I just didn't want to give one side the moral high ground on that. So I, I really appreciate this. I, what's most important right that now is that we're getting everything out on the table. Yep. Yeah. It's overdue. Because there was so, just so much confusion about um, what you were hearing in the campaign that was coming to us and then with the MAPS amendment. Yeah. So I, I want to thank our directors. You're both awesome. I want to thank my fellow commissioners. Um, I'm wondering if, based on the conversation, anybody's given any further thought to my proposal that we table both of these amendments, have a work session when the report is finalized, have a more thorough discussion, let you complete your outreach. Any further thoughts? I'd be interested to hear what Commissioner Ryan has to say. Well, I was ready to vote. Okay, let's call the vote. And then I, I will signal that I'm going to vote no on both, not because I don't respect or trust the work you've done. I just think we're shoehorning it into this process, and I'd like to know more about it before I vote on it. Please call the roll on MAPS 1. MAPS. Aye. Rubio. Um, this is a lot. Um, I also want to just you know say that um, I think I'm in a little different position than some, a lot of my colleagues on council because of my previous knowledge of this issue as parks commissioner and something that I've been engaged in and been getting updates about. And so knowing how natural lands um, are you know, specifically and currently divided and the ma vast majority are currently being managed by the Parks Bureau, it's, it's comfortable to me. So I'm not as um, you know, feeling like I don't have all the information. Um, but I am not supporting this amendment. And really, I do, and I, uh, Commissioner Maps, I want to say I really support the intent and the spirit of this amendment. It's just the first sentence that locates it, that's, that's a little bit more prescriptive, prescriptive about its location, which conflicts with the other amendment. Um, but that said, you know, I really support the entirety of the remainder of what you outlined about the work um, and that it speaks to all areas of natural resources and not just land management. So I agree that those discussions should continue. Um, I also believe that expertise that exists inside of the Bureau uh, at BES related to regulatory compliance needs to stay at BES because of their core responsibility over water, stormwater, and wastewater. Um, so this means that parks and BES need to have a clear and shared understanding um, of you know, how to compensate for that expertise and, and also how violations specifically will be handled and paid. Um, I do wish I had more time to find a path through for both the, these situations to, to really dig in since my team really only had a time to engage last night and today <laughs> and we had cancel all day. Um, and I wish, uh, you know, we had more time to kind of dig into the five years that I know we've been, uh, you know, and, and honoring that work and dialogue that's been happening for five plus years. Um, so, in the, and in this case, I've had more time and engagement with parks work. That's just how, how it happened to be because of my previous role. So, um, in conclusion, regardless of what happens with each of these amendments, I would really appreciate hearing from both service areas going forward on how this is all going to work out um, to the benefit of the environment, of course, and also um, our community. So I'm voting no uh, because of that one initial point, but I really hope that this, this dialogue continues. Ryan. No. Gonzalez. Uh, I think I'm gonna echo a lot of uh, Commissioner Rubio's uh, points here. Uh, in the interest of brevity, I'll just keep it moving along. I, I, um, I'm going to vote no on this at this point in time, but my understanding of these issues in, in a really random way, even Portland Fire deals with these in a non-intuitive way, and I've learned a lot in my bureau assignments about these complex issues um, with respect to natural areas. I, um, I have appreciated the, uh, the dialogue with both uh, bureaus that are impacted here. Uh, in both offices. Um, I hope that dialogue continues, and regardless of the votes today, um, I'm kind of signaling which way I'm going today, but it's conditional. It's subject to uh, deepening understanding of uh, these complex sort of 
operational decisions we're making, not even getting into the policy. I think I've got, gotten more clarity on the rate making pieces and I'm getting comfortable there, although there's more information, please continue to send my way uh, on that. Um, it's just a long way of saying I'm voting no on this, but I've deeply appreciated the dialogue and hope it continues. Wheeler. Yeah, I, I appreciate the dialogue too. Uncomfortable though it was, I got a lot out of it and I appreciate it, uh, particularly our directors and our commissioners for, for bringing their different perspectives. Uh, I hope we wait until the final report comes out. I look forward to reading it. I look forward to discussing it with my staff and I look forward to us holding a work session so that we go th can go through and continue this uh, conversation that we had today. I vote no, the amendment fails. Please call the roll on Ryan 1 pertaining to natural resources. Maps. No. Rubio. I won't, I won't repeat what I've just said in the context of the prior um, amendment, but in short, I do support the operational lands management and tree management shifting to the Parks Bureau again because I have more familiarity um, in this approach and model and have for two plus years. Um, but I also want to reiterate that I believe BS's regulatory expertise stay intact where it is, and um, it's just that's a very strong line for me. Um, also, I uh, want to uh, acknowledge that um, for face value, what uh, Director Long and um, indicated that this is still an ongoing conversation. The budget is really where it's gonna, we're gonna have to have a plan that actually operationalizes TBD. So um, again, I hope and expect the larger natural resources discussion uh, continues and it reaches a resolution in a timely way. I vote aye. Um, Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. No, the amendment passes. Uh, Ryan Gonzalez, one. Any further discussion, renaming of service areas? Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Um, so issues of personal safety are top of mind right now, but, but for me, um, I don't think there's a need to rename the service area. I like the idea of community being centered in the name. Um, I would, uh, you know, like to, you know, I, if I made a friendly amendment, um, I don't think that it would necessarily pass today, and I know we're all tired. So I'll simply vote no and allow us to move on. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Ryan, two, moving arts to a new service area. Is there any further discussion on this particular amendment? Commissioner Maps. Just very quickly, I know it's late um, and I don't want to get too deep into this. I'm going to vote no on this one. Um, I think arts is appropriately placed with economic development. I realize parks plays an important part uh, or has a sponsors some important arts programming and that's great. Uh, um, however, um, the arts in the life of Portland is much broader than um, what is being offered uh, through the Parks Bureau and indeed I think that if we were to move this, we would lose some opportunities to use the arts to turbocharge our economy. Um, so that's my discussion. I don't think we've called the vote yet. Or have we called the vote yet? Yeah, she's... Okay, no, then I... Haven't. Sorry, never mind. Yeah. Good. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Oh, I thought you no. <laughs> Rubio. Um, arts is uh, very connected to our community and economy. Um, and I also believe that this could easily stay in the community and economic development service area um, and could in the future move there. Um, currently, though, I, I know that there are some very important timely projects. Uh, connected to this area that are being ca carried out currently uh, by the commissioner's office. So I very much uh, support this being seen through to completion. So for, for this reason, I vote aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment passes. Gonzalez, one related to service management. Um, and I, I apologize, I do have some questions about this one. Um,
So uh, I, uh, in reading, reading this, uh, the language strikes me as somewhat inconsistent. It, it states what I think is obvious. It says nothing precludes the mayor or commissioners from initiating streamlining integration or other development of their respective service areas prior to July 1st of 2024. That is simply establishing, as I understand it, current authority? Um, that is correct. And it is, it is to communicate an intention that at least within service areas, we are committed to horizontal collaboration, which has been talked about in um, uh, extensively in the discussions about charter reform, the importance to go horizontally. What we're saying here is that we're committed to that. It may have to start inside our current responsibilities to really, and, and many of us are already doing that. Um, and so it's more of a aspirational commitment where, where we want to continue to go. Well, let, let me just lay my cards okay. on the table. I think this is inconsistent with the transition goals. As, as I read this, this maintains the silos. You still have commissioners in charge of vertical <coughs> silos. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, you continue to have commissioners in charge of service areas. That is correct. But what this is trying to communicate is that we are committed to finding ways for our existing bureaus to work more effectively together. It is an element of horizontal collaboration. Uh, it, it, it's not trying to do everything all at once, but we're putting on each of us responsibility to, in our areas, find ways for our bureaus to work better together. I would say in public safety, there are some very interesting questions about how this will all play out. Uh, fully recognize that you and I, should this pass, will have to work through some things on uh, in public safety because there are some, some pieces that are across each other's lines a little bit. So how, how would then the commissioners work with the deputy city administrator? Who, who, who's in charge of the deputy city administrator? Is it the commissioner or is it the interim city manager? It is the commissioner. Uh, although with instructions from the commission, the last part is uh, instructing each de designated deputy uh, to work cooperatively with the CAO in planning uh, for the operations of a new form of government. But that, that's the current form of government we already have, and, and clearly the voters have directed us to transition to a more horizontal structure by January 1st, 2025. So I, I think what we were getting at was we were trying to move to that structure on at least July 1st of 2024 and operate with the interim city administrator managing the entire enterprise, including the horizontal and the vertical, but then have deputy city administrators, and then if commissioners wanted it, commissioners could be advisors in specific areas or they could oversee specific programming. Uh, my concern here is this just cements what, what we're already doing. There's no point continuing the transition if you have commissioners in charge of vertical sleeves and the interim city manager has no authority? Uh, well, the subsequent resolutions do set forth the uh, city administrator's authority. Um, I do believe there, there are different visions of what that position, uh, that position's authority should be in this interim period. Uh, so I, I agree with you that in some respects that there is an incongruence with the vision you articulated and what is in these resolutions. I will say at a more fundamental level, that actually is a difference between your view of how the transition should work and potentially uh, your colleagues. That's not a disagreement on where we need to be on January 1, 2025. Uh, I think we're in unanimous agreement that a new form of government needs to be successful on that day, that we each have responsibility in getting us there. Uh, it is a different vision on how we get to that end. Um, for what for what that's worth, and and, and, and I accept that. Um, I'm just being pragmatic. We just had a half an hour discussion on two amendments where two commissioners disagreed vehemently on a very important subject, and they're both reasonable, honest, hardworking, smart people. Uh, but you know, in, intention is one thing, results are another, and what the voters told us 
is they want to get rid of the vertical silos. They want us to move towards an enterprise management system with professional management. And I don't see how we go cold turkey from December 31st, 2024 in a siloed form of government to January 1st, 2025 with a new mayor and a new city council under a completely different structure. And there, there's budgetary considerations, there's issues of systems, there's alignment, there's policies that need to be considered across the enterprise. There's no way to do that with this amendment in place. We would be static. We would be hanging on to the current form of government. I, I strongly disagree with that characterization. There's pretty explicit direction and authority granted well, to then the let, interim let CAO. Let me walk through this, because you have assigned me budget and finance. And so I would be responsible for budget and finance. Uh, I would presumably under this scheme, I would hire my own deputy city administrator and I would ignore the interim city manager's advice if I felt like it. That, that doesn't strike me as enterprise management that frankly I'd want to be part of. I th what it authorizes you to do, should you so choose, is to designate the CAO as your deputy. That's entirely your choice. You could opt not to. Uh, it, it also gives that opportunity to each of your colleagues uh, who were duly elected until uh, end of 2024 to serve as commissioners. In some <coughs> cases, we were elected until 2026 to serve as commissioners. Well, uh, I, 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 I will be stronger in my language. If this amendment passes, we are scrapping the transition process. Now, that is utterly false. Then explain That is me. a false characterization. Okay, well then explain it We are me. clearly stating we are committed to serving the new form of government January 1, 2025. How? So because we don't agree necessarily with the path that you have charted and how to get there, that does not mean we are not committed to delivering the new form of government. I think leaning towards that characterization is unfair to your colleagues. We're all duly elected to serve the city of Portland until 2024 or 2026. And we are all committed to servicing our areas to do the best job we can until then and also to support a very complicated implementation. Uh, so I, this can't be either or. It shouldn't be either or. Then what, what is the role of the deputy city administrator under your proposed amendment one? He is uh, under deputy city. Could you the refer? I'm sorry, the inter interim city manager. What is the role of the interim city manager? Because they won't have authority to bring bureaus together if the commissioners in charge of the sleeves don't agree. They won't have the ability to do a joint budget if the commissioners don't all agree. They won't be able to align systems if the commissioners don't all agree to give him that authority or her. Uh, but I'm, I'm assuming I would pick Michael. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see how this doesn't create problem after problem after problem in terms of trying to transition on a very short timeline to January 1st, 2025. The, on budget authority and to present unified budgets by service area, Again, I completely disagree with the characterization. I think our once these resolutions pass today, uh, the clear instruction to the bureau office and to the CAO and to all that are concerned is you're preparing budgets across service areas in the next cycle. Uh, and if we need to further clarify, happy to do that. But that's the full intent. Uh, with respect to the specific responsibilities and authority of the CAO, CAO they are set forth in the amended resolutions. Uh, it is, it, it, there's still a clear, uh, important role for the CAO in the transition. And at times that's elevating to council where there are tensions between bureaus and how to implement. Uh, that may not make them the final arbitrator, uh, arbiter of those conflicts. They will have to elevate it to council at times. Okay, and, and did I understand correctly, Commissioner, that the deputy city administrators would be interim number one? Yes. And number two, it is the intention, if this passes, that the commissioners would hire their own deputy city administrator to oversee their sleeve, is that correct? It would, it, it's within the purviews of the commissioner. So that may mean identify an existing resource without spending the new dollars. Uh, that that's a conceivable solution. It could be designating your exist a current director to be your deputy uh, within your service areas. We're leaving that flexibility to the commissioners on this interim so, basis. So the interim city manager might end up, in fact, with no deputy city administrators. Is that one possible outcome? I think that we look at January 1, 2025. There will certainly be in place a structure that we need to have for 
the administrative function. But this, the idea here is to be clear how we're flying until December 31st, 2024. I also, we didn't put it in the amendments or in the resolutions. I think we need to talk about a stub period sometime after elections in November of 2024. I'm not sure we have to figure that all out right now, but there is, a, there is this sort of transition of authority. While it doesn't occur until December 31st, 2024, we do have to be thoughtful on how we transition that stub period. We, we weren't ready to articulate how we'd recommend doing that here. I think we need to make space for that conversation. Well, it, it's three weeks and it's over the holidays. I just want to caution you on that. So uh, I, I, I love the city and I love our employees and they work hard, but that's probably the quietest time of year. Except for in November of 2024, when there's going to be a lot of work onboarding a new council and, and a new form of government. All right. Uh, so thank you. I appreciate, appreciate the back and too. forth as, as always. I don't know if people have other thoughts on that. If not, please call the roll on Gonzalez one. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Um, for this amendment, I'll simply share that we're already having discussions in our service area about being ready for the transition um, come July 1, 2024. So it's in alignment with what we're, we're already doing. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, two things. I love working with this current city council, and I like that we're taking on tough uh, conversations and we, we, we move the work forward. I want us to make sure that we are uh, in that seat um, t for the will of the voters um, until the very end of December. And the second point is I look forward to the shared leadership decisions that we will do with the interim CEO. CAO, sorry. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Wheeler. Well, needless to say, I'm deeply disappointed. I think this sets us way back. I think this will create additional impediments to making this transition a successful one. I think we've just added a ton of work to Michael's plate. I think we've disrespected the work of the transition team up to this point. That said, I'm not a quitter. Um, and I hear my colleagues and I respect their voice. We will figure out how to make it work. Michael, will you commit to, we'll, we'll sit down and we'll make it work. Um, so I vote aye, but I'm clearly outgunned on this one. The amendment passes. Next one, uh, Ryan Amendment 3, approval of the interim. I'm sorry, I vote nay, thank you. Uh, but I still lose, thank you. Uh, Ryan Amendment 3. I, I think we have Gonzalez Amendment 2. Did I skip one? I think so. Yeah, reservation. Yeah. Oh, I'm amendment. sorry. I'm looking at the wrong one. Thank you. Uh, Gonzalez 2, which is reservation of authority. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Uh, this is very similar. Uh, again, this maintains silos through 2024. Um, it maintains the status quo. I vote no, but the amendment passes. Uh, Ryan Amendment 3, approval of the interim CAO. Maps. Uh, I think I can... I'd like to have some discussion on this one. Um, amendments have been evolving over the course of the last day or two, and even maybe over the course of the day. One of the questions I had um, was, I believe some amendment uh, was on the table that essentially allowed uh, commissioners to es essentially appoint their own uh, deputy city or deputy city administrators, um, which struck me as being a little bit inconsistent with um, the practice of the mayor not being able to um, appoint his uh, interim chief administrative officer. Um, and I, I feel like Commissioner Gonzalez might be the expert in this space. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, uh, given your understanding of the amendments on the table, yeah. uh, what's the practical effect of Ryan 3? The, the, and certainly we can have Robert supplement uh, big, as big as the language has evolved a little bit here. So Gonzalez 1 clarifies that both the mayor and a commissioning charge may designate a deputy. So every, that's one of the lang areas of language uh, changed is that any of the five of us can designate a deputy. Okay. Uh, uh, the mayor's not at all, hands are not at all tied there. Um, what has changed in this language 
is we initially proposed that the city administrator or the CAO would have to be approved by a majority of this council. Um, we've actually softened that language here. Uh, we're, we need to be essentially be consulted. We need to be engaged. This parallels a little bit how uh, uh, I believe the CSD uh, had was uh, set up. Um, I will call out in testimony, there is an interesting question. If this council doesn't approve the interim city administrator, do they actually carry forward to the next form of government? And I don't know. I mean, it, it, and it's, you know, they would be approved under the existing charter. The new charter says that a city administrator has to be approved by council. I, I know in some of the dialogue, we thought, well, the previous council approves that will be sufficient temporarily uh, for the new form of government, but that's kind of an interesting legal question. So I, one, did I answer your question? I just want to make sure I'm answering your question, but it, it, it led to. So to, I, um, I might have missed it. It's, it's been a long day. Um, so since Gonzalez won past, um, does that functionally make Ryan three Butte? I don't think so. I mean, we, I, I, I don't think so. It's asking that we be consulted on the city administrator. I mean, that's essentially, in, that's, and it's, uh, it's softer than the way it previously uh, said. I, I, I guess I think I'm getting to your point though. If the mayor wanted to adopt an interim CAO, they can certainly adopt a deputy. You know, does this, this is this some way weaken the mayor's power? It's not really the intent. I mean, the goal here is really setting up for the, what goes in the next form of government. Is that where you're? Is that where you're? Is that where you're getting that we're somehow discriminating against the mayor? Uh, yeah, that was my that was my concern. Although that, that I think literally this amendment looks different today than it did, or at this hour than it did last night when I went it to It did, bed. it changed. This is definitely, previously they said majority council had to approve. I, I don't know, Robert, we have thoughts on here that, on this piece. I uh, Robert Taylor, city attorney. I, um, so the, the council uh, just passed Gonzalez one. Uh, that gives the mayor and each commissioner the ability to designate a deputy in charge of their service areas. And that designation is at the sole discretion of the mayor or commissioner in charge. That's how that amendment works that was just passed. This uh, Ryan Amendment 3 would provide that in the event an interim city administrator is hired, then uh, the mayor would involve all of the council members and their staff in the hiring of that person. So under the amendment we just passed, appointment of the deputies, sole and complete discretion of the commissioner in charge or the mayor. Under this, the hiring of the interim city administrator would take the input of all of the council members in the hiring process. To, to be clear, the deputies no longer report to the city administrator. They report to the commissioners. Under the amendment that was just that passed, correct. the deputies appoint, so report to that, the commissioners that is not in charge. You, you are presuming what might happen. Yes, yeah. Or I, could. That's right. I think if we're talking about who has, a, who has authority and who has to be involved in the hiring process compared to the amendment that was just passed versus this amendment. I think that's the big difference. This requires um, uh, input from other offices. And, and Commissioner Maus, I mean, yeah. kind of my thought is, I mean, if the, the rest of these amendments pass, this may be unimportant, um, except I think we still have to face the question of what, so we, uh, identify an interim CAO, what is their authority on January 1, 2025? And if this council doesn't approve that CAO, do they have less authority than they otherwise would? So the commissioner, the way I, the way I think of that is you, you, you have to 
separate the position from the person who's in the position. And so the position would be created by uh, action of council through an ordinance through the budget. We would say there is now an interim city administrator. That interim city administrator will serve from this date through the first six months of the new form of government subject to the new mayor's authority to fire that person day one and hire somebody else. That council can take that action now to provide for that continuity of the position and authority subject to the authority in the new charter for the mayor to just fire that person. Who actually serves in that role? You know, so right now, for example, if, if, if we had that position and that position reported to the mayor under our current form of government, the mayor has sole discretion to appoint who the mayor wants in that position. So, and I think to get back to the mayor's point about the, the amendment we just passed and then this amendment, um, you know, if, if the mayor would choose to use the, the deputy city administrator and designate that person in his sole discretion, you know, maybe we don't do an interim city administrator. I think a lot of these things are sort of up um, up for future discussion once we know well, what this and, final Well, the question was about like. January 1st, and the answer is the question is undefined. We, you know, the city administrator would have the same fairly limited authority that we just, or the majority just agreed to under this amendment. It would be up to the new council to come in and give the city administrator different authority and do the work of moving the organization towards an enterprise-wide management system. Well, I we, think we have just punted that to 2025. Well, except, ex except, Mayor, January 1, 2025, by operation of law, the new charter goes into effect. And under that charter, ah, all the point. city employees point. report up to the city administrator. Correct. So January 1, 2025, the mayor can fire the existing city administrator, appoint a new city administrator. That person can then fire all the deputies and appoint new people. And we can start fresh day one. Or, or they can keep them or do some combination of that. So Robert, I just want to be crystal clear on this. I know this is hypothetical, but just play through that exact scenario you just described. But if that city administrator has not been ratified by a city council, whether the old city council or the new one, uh, it, are you, does, that, does that create an ambiguity in your mind? Uh, I, I think that we would, I think an action by this council to create the position and provide the continuity of authority would give that person the authority to- Sufficient, sufficient to give them, to, to take them into the, and, yes. until again, the next mayor has the option. Subject to the next mayor making an appointment and confirmation. We have a similar issue with the police chief, for example. Mm -hmm. We want this council to take some action to make sure that there and is- And city a, attorney for that And matter. city attorney. That's right. So you want to have some, regardless of who is in that position, you want to make sure that the authority of that position continues through January to give the new mayor, new council, some ability to, to make a decision. Okay. So Robert, to say it another way, when, when the new council's on board and the mayor appoints the city administrator, the council does have to go through a process of approving them. Yes. Yeah. So yes. this was in the spirit of a practice that we will be implementing in, on January 2025 and to give it momentum. And, and, and Commissioner Maps, I mean, what I would say is I'm not sure this is necessary, but yeah. the last thing I want to do is, I mean, I, I don't want to disrupt the mayor's ability to do the same thing the rest of us do. Yeah. It was originally designed to, to when we were concerned about the CAO having broad authority over our bureaus, that was part of the concern here. I just don't feel strong about this 
one way or another, to be honest with you. But uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I want to thank staff and my colleagues for this discussion. Um, I th I'm going to vote no on this one. I don't think we have called the vote yet. Have we called the vote yet? No. I've lost track no, of where we're not at. Yet. So just so uh, um, I understand the spirit of what Commissioner Ryan was trying to do here, um, I think it may voting be yes, right. a little bit redundant yes. in this particular space. So yes. when we do call the piper, I'm going to be a no. But have, I don't think we've called the votes yet, have we? Any further discussion? She has a comment. Please call the roll. No. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. No. The amendment passes. Mr. Uh, Mayor, point of privilege. Yes. yes. Um, I'll just say, for those of you who park in the parking garage across the street and you give your key fob to the guy because it's really busy, I don't know what time they go home. Seven o'clock. Uh, I, I suspect seven, seven o'clock. Yeah. All right. So you might have, you're either out of luck or you, it sounds like you have a, a, about another hour before uh, you're walking home. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, good, good call. Uh, uh, I believe Gonzalez three is next. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Transition and authority for council. Uh, what what does this do that's different than what was previously voted on? I think the second part of this is really just talking that we still have work to do to identify how the last six months of transition is going to occur. Uh, those would be discussions led by you uh, with each of us, uh, including uh, in our service areas on what's the, what's the right way to fly in those last six months. So while we're setting up a general framework for how operation of the city is going to go until December 31st, 2024 today, um, there's still going to be further um, design work that needs to be sorted out, led by you. Um, At least the second part. That's yeah, and I'm always happy to have these conversations, and I've had a lot of them, and I've offered a lot of them, and I'll continue to offer a lot of them, and Michael and I will always have a door open to do that, to discuss the issues that are here. Uh, the... Um, you know, th this is also a restatement of the uh, commissioners being able to choose their own deputies. That issue is now settled. Um, minimum classifications still have to come forward, Robert, for the DCAs. I mean, I, I understand now the commissioners can select their own, but there's going to be minimum requirement standards. I, I believe the classifications would still have to be approved by council. By council, yeah, correct. They're due. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have any further questions. Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. No. The motion passes. Gonzalez for transition. Uh, I did have a question on this. Um, where Where is the rest of the org chart? This speaks to one layer of the organizational chart, but it doesn't speak to other senior level positions listed on the org chart. It doesn't talk about the, the, the natural resources person the or the sustainability officer, the equity officer, um, communications officer. Where, where are they in this language? Well, I think there's really two parts. And one, we're clearly adopting today uh, approval of the service areas as amended, uh, including its composition. Uh, in the concept of deputy city attorney, uh, deputy city administrators, and that that would be effective. We wanted to be clear that in some ways on a date, July 1, 2024, even though, um, you know, I think that's open discussion and we want to make that org chart sooner or later, but this would make it clear that it's effective July 1, 2024. 
The second part is also just being clear, we have to have a whole separate discussion on authorizing positions and, and the budget process. So even though we're adopting the org chart, each of the positions in, in there uh, are still just you know, subject to budget discussion, authorization, and uh, the other components that uh, Robert and um, team had sort of alluded to. We have to define some of these roles. Did, did legal counsel, did you review this? Yes. So um, I have a question maybe for you. Um, obviously the transition team, they're already feeling the pressure of time. Uh, and they need an indication that they can move forward in developing classifications and pay ranges uh, for the full org chart. Um, th does this allow that to move forward? And I guess I'm also not clear on whether the council wants to move forward on that. My, my, my reading of this is that it would uh, give the direction to the transition team that this is the organizational structure that council is anticipating budgeting into starting July 1, 2024. And that council can start doing things in anticipation of that. So creating the classifications. But, but only for, but the, not for all the classifications, if I'm reading this correctly. Um, I think that there's, there's other amendments that come later that also get to that point about directing the budget office to organize the 24-25 budget in alignment with the new org chart. So I think some of, some of these uh, amendments build on each other, but the, the, the important point is that this council is telling the transition team that it should take the steps in anticipation of budgeting into an org chart that looks like this starting July 1, 2024. And then council is also reserving its authority to make those budget decisions. So, so decisions. define beginning July 1st, 2024. I mean, they're, they're ready to do this now. They're ready to go forward with that work. Does this preclude them from starting that work until July 1st, 2024? No, I don't think it prohibits that. It doesn't prohibit the pre-work, no. Okay, I just want to make sure we have that on the record. No, and I'd be clear, I, I actually am encouraging it. We want a, a fiscal budget for 2024, 25 that makes sense. We have a lot of complexity to work through. There are also going to be some very difficult budget decisions, and that's what the second sentence is trying to allude to. But um, we're trying to fly in formation so we can prepare a good budget in Got the next it. cycle. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Gonzalez 5, the authority of the chief administrative officer. And I do have some questions on this, if I can find my paper here. So, um, and this may be a moot point at this point. Um, Michael, could you come up, please? So, my original reading of this was that it makes it very, very difficult to think about things at the enterprise level. And I know you've had a chance to go through this amendment. Could you give us your impression of it? Sure, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. Um, I think the uh, page that has the chart that shows where current language changes to different language uh, in a couple of cases presents uh, uh, a limitation on, for instance, the second, second row uh, refers to the technical implementation team and that the team is authorized to act uh, but uh, it appears that it's authorized to act in the budget and finance and city operation service areas and not the others, which is a concern regarding technical implementation of the org chart for the whole enterprise because there are technical 
pieces that interrelate and cover the whole city, not just certain service areas. And I may be reading that wrong, but that's how I read it, the, the language on it on its face. Mike, could you give, I know we're getting late, but could you give some examples of where that would be outside of um, budget and finance and city operations service areas? Well, the org chart, if adopted, moves programs from one service area to another. And some of those service areas aren't finance and budget and operations. And uh, for instance, the couple of programs that move from the CAO's office now into uh, community and economic development. We need to be able to consider all of the service areas when we're making technical changes, whether it's in SAP or it's in the human resources systems, particularly in the budget systems. So we really just have to consider the whole enterprise when we do this. Um, obviously, we have to, given, given the amendments that have already passed, we have to do this in conjunction with you who oversee those other service areas. So, so Michael, so. under this amendment, who's in charge? Who, who's, who's making decisions? I think we would need to make, we would need to um, recommend technical changes and make sure that everybody's on board with those things. To be, to be practical, most of these things aren't issues that are policy issues or those kinds of things. They're issues of implementing what this council directs as the change in organizational structure. <coughs> Elise is here, she's much more versed in the technical changes that have to happen on the backside. And please be kind to Elise, because I owe her everything if we're gonna be successful <laughs> over the next 14 months. <laughs> Good evening, I know you're all tired. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, my name is Elise Rosenberg. I'm the Deputy Director of the Bureau of Technology Services, but I'm also serving as the sponsor for technical implementation. And just at a very high level, what that means is taking whatever decisions you all make from an organizational chart level, big boxes, breaking it down into very, very little boxes, which position goes where, backed by what revenue, having authority over what spend, over what contracts, uh, over whose timesheets, uh, how does that roll back up into a budget that's transparent to our community and that reflects the organizational chart? So all the way back down and all the way back up through systems like SAP, like our budget system, and there are about 100 integrations between other systems. And so uh, each bureau has had a lot of latitude about the way they want to structure their bureaus to follow their function, right? They have a mission to complete. They structure their bureau financially and personnel-wise in terms of the way that they need in order to develop and deliver that function. And they have the expertise to make sure that uh, while we might put systems and processes together to try to accommodate these changes at scale, which will be extremely challenging, in order for them to be successful in the bureaus, we really need to work with every bureau who's impacted. And we actually already have a structure in place where bureaus have designated experts that are working with our technical team, they have been since August, to be on standby uh, to help us actually process these in a way where those bureaus can be successful. Got it. Does that make sense? It, it, very helpful. And what I would call out here, Mike, is that Gonzales Amendment 1, it, it directs deputies to work with you mm -hmm. to facilitate uh, completion of charter reform implementation by January 1, 2025. So uh, they have explicit instructions to do so. Uh, we are also ratifying the org chart today mm -hmm. uh, that hopefully gives the structure in which this work would be done. So if you find a technical gap in your technical authority, a little pun there, uh, uh, it, I think you can come back. I, I mean, you, you have other things to hang your hats on uh, in what we've approved here. And if you're getting you know, obstruction from a designated deputy, frankly, if you're getting obstruction from a commissioner, like you, mm -hmm. you have something to point to in, in here. Um, that's what I'd submit. All right, uh, any further 
I've uh, kind of Commissioner Maps. Uh, I've kind of lost uh, track of the plot here. Commissioner Gonzalez, can you briefly summarize what you're trying to get at with this uh, amendment? Yeah, and this is this was essentially uh, there were broad authority uh, provisions granted to the CAO in the original uh, resolution before us. Um, I think much of it was intended to address the transition. The, the challenge is always, you know, when you get into the nitty gritty, um, does this inadvertently undermine um, existing commissioners' ability to function over their, their service areas? And so uh, the spirit of these edits is just, Mike's got a bunch of work to do, technical team have a bunch of work to do. They can do whatever the heck they want inside of the first two service areas, the kind of the internally yeah. focused ones. If there are issues they bring outside of those, one, deputies have to cooperate with them. They're explicitly instructed to work with Mike uh, under Gonzales one. But those issues would potentially get arbitrated by us if there's tension between a bureau and the, their, their work. Uh, mm -hmm hoping that's not going to be very much, right? But that's the, that, that would be, that's the rub. It wouldn't be uh, uh, un, unregulated uh, authority in the CAO to, to resolve that, that they would eventually have to pump back to us if there's, if there's substantial issues. I suspect we don't want to deal with the technical issues. It's tr the problem is, is how do we define it in such a way that, you know, we frankly really, I suspect, want to delegate that to you guys uh, if it, uh, doesn't create a um, unintended consequence. So I, um, again, what I call it, Commissioner Maps, is if this is insufficient authority for them, they can come back and tell us and we, you know, I, we're not trying to obstruct, let me be clear. Um, just didn't want to have unintended consequences of over-delegation. Gonzalez, four, call the roll. Maps. I appreciate this discussion. I'll be transparent here. I'm not sure if I fully track the uh, ins and outs of this amendment, which is why I'm going to vote no. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you vote? He voted no. No. Okay. Thank you. And actually, just a quick clarification. This is Gonzalez 5. Uh, you're right. I stand corrected. It is Gonzalez 5. You want to keep your vote the way yeah, it was? Yeah. Okay. That's why thank I, you. And, yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay. Rubio. You can change if you want, because I misread. Do you want to change your vote? No, my kid's just going to miss soccer practice. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Rubio. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. No. Uh, the amendment passes. Gonzalez number, no, I think we're to Ryan again, aren't we? Let's see. Ryan four. Um, so I have a question about Ryan four. So. I understand that uh, it deprioritizes both the city council chamber and the offices on the second floor. And I, I thought we'd already given head nods to city staff to go forward with the CMGC and the architects on both of those. Uh, I I don't think anything takes away going forward on the the timeline that we've talked about. And what this specifies that uh, the chamber, the goal is to deliver a chamber by January 1, 2025, uh, and what we call workspaces near the council chambers, uh, that that can start as soon as possible, the necessary procurement. Uh, and that, that work would begin by July 1. When, so when we say in the 24-25 fiscal year, that's, I'm looking, looking to be, that, just to translate that into dates, that's well, July let, 1, 2020. Okay, fa fair enough. So let, let me suggest Four. this, because we, we had a facilities work session, and at the end of the work session, we you know, were tasked, I was tasked, the transition team was tasked, with working on a detailed resolution that encompasses all of what council had discussed over the last several weeks related to discussion. I don't understand why it's coming up here in the context of an org chart. Well, I, I actually think at the end of the last facilities work session, there was a request to what you labeled the majority to come back with a plan that would be acceptable. There were conversations as 
as colleagues that I think we gravitated towards an agreement on what that timeline looks for. But I actually walked out of the last work session with the interpretation that you had requested of us to come back with a plan uh, uh, that would be consistent with, and I've got to get the ordinance number, 191246, which calls for actually a report to be delivered by the chief procurement officer. So we felt like we were doing our homework in attempt to try and uh, uh, be consistent with the conversations that were had, including, and the reason it was highest priority listed, um, delivery of district offices. That was articulated as a high priority by many of us during that work session. Um, and when it respect to delivery of the new mayor and city administrative office is a highest priority, um, we see that as an easy get. You can set up. Well, let, 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 yeah, me ask, let me ask you a specific question because I'm, I'm getting nervous for Commissioner Maps. Um, so it says moving the council chamber renovations to quote a closer proximity to offices. We agreed in work session with the thumbs up that the offices wouldn't start until July 1st, but we heard from the CMGC and the architect they need a year to do the chamber. So are we delaying the work of the chamber? No. Oh, well, why, why is this language here? It's, a, it's to give procurement and give facilities. If they came back and it was going to save us a million bucks, right? to start chambers on March 1 instead of January 1, it gives them the ability to come back and do that estimation. I'm not sure that's the case, but we heard in the work session it actually became crystal clear that the bigger the gap between starting chamber and starting offices on the second floor adds to cost. And so if we're not prejudging, we just heard that loud and clear, so we're giving them flexibility if they want to uh, compress those two together. Well, we, we already have checkpoints built in, and one of them is we have to come back to council with the guaranteed maximum price. And if we add additional checkpoints, that seems to me it's just adding uncertainty and adding cost and potentially making the work of the CMGCs more difficult. I'm not, I don't see why we do that. I don't, what's, what's the gain? I, the, the only piece is if it came back and, and they told us that you're starting second floor offices on July 1. That's set. We've all agreed on that, right? July 1, 2024. Yeah, I think, I think and, so did, it's, yes. and, and we're also committed <laughs> to starting chambers January 1, 2024. But if they came back, we heard it, that, they, that the longer, that, the bigger that delta between those two dates, it can drive up costs. So if they want to delay council chambers, they can do it a little bit if it materially saves costs. That's, that's the space we're giving to facilities. Frankly, we're giving it back to you. If you conclude it's not really worth it uh, in that plan, then so be it. We're still January 1 and July 1. I guess I just have one comment about, about Exhibit C. And, and uh, as long as the intent is that we can begin chambers January 1 and begin second floor offices July 1, I think that will probably meet what the discussion was about. I do have a concern about uh, the last sentence under B, 2B, which commencement date of work is subject to the approval by the majority of council of temporary workspace. So I will tell you, we probably need to get that done very soon. Well, ha hasn't Be everybody seen the temporary workspace? Because each of the CMGC, each of the guaranteed maximum prices, mm -hmm. there will be three, I understand. Uh, two to three. And each of them are somewhat dependent on all of them being approved. Mobilization, demobilization, you heard from the CMGC. They need to plan for the entire work plan mm -hmm. before they can give you the first guaranteed maximum price. We need that soon so that we can mobilize by January 1st, I believe, for council chambers or ish. And, and so they're interdependent, which means the second floor space, if it is dependent on your approval of temporary space, we need that approval like soon. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of the interdependencies of the different parts of the project as it goes to cost for the CMGC. And 
the people who really know what they're talking about are here. <laughs> so uh, I may be off, and they can say what the director meant to say was, and I'd appreciate that. So now you want your, go ahead. If you want to add. Caitlin McGee. So we could go forward with GMP-1 based off of the mm -hmm. most efficient yeah, process of construction and then either do a change oh, order to add cost. No, 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 no. So. <laughs> no change orders, please. So I'm just saying, just just you know, we could go forward with what we assumed or were um, approved to do so. But the goal would be to have everything outlined so that when we come to you with our GMPs, the multiple ones at one time, we understand and outline the schedule and how they impact each other. So they're not, we're not coming back to you with added costs. It, that's helpful. Can you remind me the difference between plan one and plan two, just in the original ordinance? Plan one was, or one was chambers and two was office space. I'm just trying to remember how the Correct. ordinance, yeah. the original ordinance yes. was offered. The GMPs, yeah. Got um, it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, frankly, this, Maddie, this is as much for you guys. Like the, the hope uh, I had understood our homework was to come back and come up with a plan out of the last work session and, and to reflect dates that were being discussed. The goal here was to give you guidance on how to you know, well, really the chief procurement officer under the ordinance on how to come back with a plan that is reflective. There are some wrinkles around here, right? I mean, the, uh, I don't, I understand what Mike's saying about the temporary space. We're hoping that that's gonna be promptly resolved. There was originally concerns when staff saw the space initially um, that was initially proposed. So that's, we just wanted to make sure we weren't being surprised. Um, but the other piece came out of the direct conversations with CMG that just started in the work session. If, if, if there's too big a gap between the, the starting of the two projects, and frankly, the mayor's office is the third component. We have three components. Of, the more they can keep subs here, the more uh, continuously we heard that loud and clear, that saved money. I don't know how to quantify it. I mean, that's up for, for you guys, but. Yeah, I think. Uh, so you're correct. The longer the delay between GMP-1 and GMP-2 starting, the more the price goes up. Um, I think I have a question in this amendment as to what constitutes a material cost savings. <laughs> um, so I don't know how we define material, but what we can say is by not launching all of the work January 1st and giving ourselves maximum flexibility, we will start to see a slowly incrementally increasing cost. At what point that becomes material, I don't know because it's not defined. But I think we are comfortable as a design team and construction team with having a confirmation that cha chamber starts January 1st and having a confirmation that offices can start July 1st. And I think to Mike's point, we are reaching the point where um, bouncing around with in uncertainty about what might start when is becoming a hazard unto its own. And so I think what I would encourage is um, I know that the mayor's office has been working on a resolution. I've seen that resolution. We've put a lot of input into that. And I think it fairly strikes the balance that everybody was seeking. So I don't know what my place is here, but I might recommend tabling this and seeing that resolution because we are also at a situation where for council chambers to start January 1st, which is what hits that year long deadline, we are having to decommission this space. So it, it's really not possible for us to decommission this, move it up to 1900, and <clears throat> then have a decision to wait to delay chambers to July 1st, because now we have yeah. all of our electronic equipment up at 1900, and people still wanting, I guess, to have chambers here. Maddie, heard you. Okay. Um, this does have my name on it. Um, I'd like to table it. Yeah, thank, okay. thank you for the new information okay. I just got. I think that's the yep. solution coming oh, from the mayor's you. office. Very, very helpful. Without objection. Ryan, five authority to change. Oh, let's vote on that. Just kidding. Um, thank you, Matt. Yeah. We're done. We got one more. We got one more. Oh. But you guys are. Oh, we're done. So I, I'm trying to figure out what Ryan, five. It's to bring does. the budget into this. It's been difficult for me and many voters to see what, even those that voted yes on it, to see the escalating cost. And so it's to rein that in and to make sure that we have some checks and balances going forward. And right now we're, we're projecting to go way over the ceiling that was in all the materials to the voters. 
So in the spirit of will to voters, this is why this is um, an amendment and for us to get some fiscal discipline going forward. So we had a uh, uh, work session, gosh, was that just yesterday? Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think a couple of points were made by the budget office. The first is the council already has and will retain amendment authority for decisions that are made during the actual budget process. And there's nothing that changes the council's authority. And the budget office emphasized that point, and they also outlined some of the trade-offs of staffing and funding decisions um, that, that we have to be prepared for. So I, I don't see how this alters or adjusts the current authorities already granted to council. I don't see what this does. Tim, I don't know if, if I got it wrong, just tell me I'm wrong, it's late. And sorry, you have to say your name yeah, for the record. Okay. I, th I think what you're, you're referencing is what I, what I came to you yesterday to say is you will have the authority you've always had as we price the, the components of the charter change. You'll have the ability to change things as we go through. I'm, I'm assuming that the first time you will see a plan, and I'm also assuming that the mayor will be consulting with you, will be in the proposed budget. That proposed budget will come to you as the city budget council, and you'll be able to amend that. So if there's things in there that you want to change, you'll have the, uh, the option for doing that. And then once the adopted budget's approved, we move quickly and, excuse me, the approved budget is approved, we quickly move into the adopted budget. And normally there's not as much flexibility in changing them, but you could still adopt at that point. So I guess what I'm telling you is you'll have the opportunity for weighing in on the fiscal aspects of what we're paying for in this charter amendment as we flow through the budget process. I appreciate that, Tim, and I did hear you, and having this in the public record again is great. I just want to make sure we're memorializing that right. so that we actually did have that authority. Right. Nothing changes in terms of the budget committee. And there is quite a big delta at the moment, and I just want to make sure we're all aware of that. And, and I, for one, appreciated Commissioner Ryan's point on this, that we at least spend some time in the budget process talking about a, a scenario under which the contours of transition are as what the voters were told, right? So we may move well beyond that, recognizing the realities, but yeah. voters were told something. Well, the, the, vo the voters were given a document that had, and if you go back and review, it had numerous points where it said, these are estimates. And they talked about all the risk of the estimates because it was done very quickly. And now we're in a situation where we have things like inflation and things that are happening that are just frankly going to increase the cost of what we told to the voters. Tim, I understand mm -hmm. that to a point, right? But yeah. the low end of the estimate was 900000 and we're talking $23 million, right? And $13 million of which is new. This isn't a small... Well, you we know, don't start with the 900,000. We gave them a range. Of, well, I wasn't here right. at the time. No, the but ceiling. We the gave ceiling them a fairly large the, range on the costs. The ceiling was 18.7. Right. So I understand what you're saying. We, we, we will need to explain. We will need to explain the types of, of ex uh, expenditure increases that occurred um, based upon th that that um, original estimate to make sure to understand why we had things. For example, you're just talking about the 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 um, construction things here. Not all that was included in the way it was included in the but original estimate. I think the construction is completely out of it, right? 900,000 8.7 was right. ongoing. So just to be, so well, again, that's it, why it did I- did have provision for regional offices and things like that in the estimate. Outside of the, yeah. the fall. Okay. Uh, Tim, Tim, just before you go, uh, just so I'm clear here, it's your um, analysis that this amendment is largely redundant with authorities that we already have? Right. Okay, thank you. Well, and, well, can I follow, yeah, follow up ahead. to that question? How come so, you believed it when I said it? Uh, how, how, how do, <laughs> then how will we present in the budget process the deltas between what voters were told and what is in the mayor's proposed? We, we, once we have a proposal, we can work backwards and say, here's what's different than what were in those estimates at the time. And that'll be up to you as you go through the budget process if you want to create different scenarios in terms of what we're actually going to fund. And 
the, yeah, I mean, I, I think the struggle for me, Commissioner Maps, and I'm sorry we're here so late, is that the, the budget that we've seen so far was built from an org chart. It was kind of top right, and, we, and yet I feel we have a responsibility as stewards. Voters were told this, and what is the level of government you get with that? It may be insufficient. We may all sit around and conclude 900,000, 8.7 is not going to work, right? I mean, it's but that that we automatically go with the larger number with just sort of skipping over. And I, I don't mean to be flipped there, right? But it's but we just move past the original estimates as though those weren't real constraints in our analytical process. And I, that's where I take some exception. That's why I like I like Ryan's amendment here. And I don't think it's superfluous from that perspective. But well, how we're going to prepare our budget because budgets. You, you think we have a lot of time to do a budget process, but we really don't. It's a fairly aut automated type of system. We're going to be doing whatever you agree to on the charter, organizational chart, and that's how we will create our budgeting. Now, it's up to you if you want us to develop other scenarios as we go through that budget process. And okay. just to reiterate, let, let's say the org chart has a certain number of positions if those positions aren't funded during the budget process, they don't happen. I mean, that's basically right. It. Okay. Um, Council has final authority on that. Commissioner Maps. All right, so I'll uh, hand up, but I, I think it went away. Um, uh, just uh, before we uh, I'll call the roll here, uh, um, Commissioner Ryan, can you remind me what the intent of this amendment was again? What are you trying to accomplish here? I was accomplishing what I said earlier, and it's in writing, which is that we uh, promised in the voters pamphlet and all the materials what the ceiling was, and we're dramatically over that ceiling right now. So I wanted to call that out so that we could be fiscally responsible as we continue to move forward. I have been listening just like you, that we actually have that authority, of course, in the budget process. I still felt it was necessary to call it out. I was in agreement with the testimony that said we have a top heavy org chart that we're putting forward. And so we're going to have to make some tough decisions going forward. So it's a way to just memorialize that and remind people the will of the voters read into this that the ceiling was 8.7. And we're looking at right now um, being 13 million over that. That's not that's that takes inflation to a whole nother level. So, but no, yeah. <laughs> but I do think I, I understand what you're saying, Commissioner. I think we do as we go through the budget process need to to have clear information for you on what changed from that original estimation. And then you can make decisions on whether or not those things should continue. And I was just trying to like take that those instructions throughout our our many conversations while I was looking at the council offices saying, man, they look pretty good to me, so I don't know why we have to spend this much money. So throughout this journey, I've just been doing the best I can, like all of us, to be fiscally responsible. Um, colleagues, I, I, I noticed that Ruth Levine has her hand up. Is that someone we want to call on? Cool. Well, the only no, that's, that? that's not a city employee, is it? It is. That's it is? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, call so on Ruth. Then. It seems Ruth, like we sorry. should. Ruth, are you? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I sorry. No, I apologize. I sorry about that. Go sorry. ahead. I know it's late. I just wanted to be super clear about what the original estimates, um, what the numbers you're talking about, where the ceiling is 8.7. That was that that particular number is taking out the current budget we had at that time. So it was making assumptions in some cases about how things would be funded that council has not yet made decisions on, if that makes sense. So I, I, I'm not, I, I just, I, I just wanted to flag that it may not be entirely apples to apples. It doesn't change the like underlying sentiment. I just wanted to correct for the record that I, I want to be clear, first of all, that it's, it's assuming certain current costs that would go away in the new structure. And so I just don't want, um, so yeah, it, it, it's not entirely at this point an apples to apples comparison because we just haven't made all the decisions. You, you haven't made all the decisions about how things would be funded. Does that make sense? Mayor, can I make a suggestion that we um, bring to you an outline of what was in the um, assumptions and the calculations at the time that was presented to the Charter Commission when they were making their recommendations. It is 
very slim. It is, does not include a deputy city administrator structure. It does not include the equity position, the sustainability position, any of those positions that are reporting within the city administrator's office. I think that that might clarify for you what was in the, the, those numbers, because I think that there might be con confusion. And I think to Ruth's point, it's not an apples to apples comparison if we're uh, including the deputy structure, if we're including a lot of the things that came out of the, the um, organizational and conversations. I think we've actually done some of yeah. that previously. So let's just make sure that you have that information. It's just, that's appreciated. I mean, what I would, not to belabor this point, right, but voters approve something. We as elected, electeds will be asked to approve some things, including the budget. There are a number of decisions that have been made neither by voters or by electeds that are at this point sort of the, you know, the foundation for producing the budget. And that's where you're seeing some discomfort and just putting you on the record. I, I, we're gonna be talking about in the budget cycle what voters were told. Uh, and it's, you can choose how to frame it and present it, but there are many decisions that have been made to date without electives weighing in or the voters weighted in that are embedded in that 13 million. Can we? And, and today's can we your day to make those decisions. So, and we'll reflect that, of course, when we come back. And, and we will get that document to you that she was just responding to, so we can, we are all on the same page as to what's changed since that estimate. Okay, any right. further discussion on this amendment? Call the roll. Naps. Um, based on the staff testimony that we heard on this one, I'm gonna vote no. Uh, this amendment appears to be redundant and a little bit performative. Rubio. Um, I really appreciate uh, the spirit in which this was brought forward, and, and I appreciate um, Commissioner Riley lifting up the point that we have to be um, have be good stewards of public funds. Um, and it was also really helpful to hear um, the staff um, talk about what how this how this impacts and if this is consequential or not to the budget process. And so, no, hearing that. It, uh, it is not, um, and I, I do believe the budget process is the best way to kind of address exactly this, so I'm going to vote no. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. No, the amendment fails. To the main motion, this is the resolution as amended. Any further discussion? Mayor, I think we Commissioner need Gonzalez. to clarify with respect to the amendments that to the extent that language in the original resolutions or exhibits is inconsistent with the amendments adopted by council today, the amendment shall be controlled. Just that we clarify that on the record. Um, I'm gonna to defer to legal counsel. That sounds like a legal question. Yes, and I think we'd recommend that because that gives direction to staff. I think it could be done by consensus of the council rather than a motion and vote, but it's up to presiding to decide. Great, any further discussion on the resolution is amended. Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Hard no. Uh, this is a mishmash of confusing, poorly vetted, and I think in some cases possibly contradictory amendments that were brought forward with minimal opportunity to discuss. Uh, they doubled down on the siloed nature of our current form of government and wrapped them in a thin veneer of wishful thinking. That said, um, I think this is going to have the collective impact of slowing down the process, under-resourcing the process and quite possibly the operations of the city under the next city council, at least initially, they'll have the opportunity to fix it. And this probably adds costs. I still don't understand why offices worked their way into this discussion today. This was about the org chart. We already agreed on what we were doing around the offices. We'd already told our private sector partners what we were going to do. And to have an amendment that says this whole thing is dependent upon whether a majority of commissioners like their temporary office space 
is ridiculous. You asked for a plan. And, well, it's, it's, it's in there. Um, as You requested a, a plan. We gave you a plan. Excuse me. This is my vote, and I get to interpret it the way I want to interpret okay. it. Go ahead and, and grandstand all you want. I would just simply refer people to the black and white language of what is now in the resolution as adopted. So um, that said, I'm an expert at taking garbage and turning it into something great. And Michael, you've been doing this for a long time. You and your team will do our best, and we will live up to the obligations, both of the council's resolution as well as to the spirit of what the voters asked us to do. I vote no. The resolution passes as adopted. We are adjourned.